on observational astronomy. And uh, it is a pleasure and indeed an honor to introduce uh, Professor Somnath Bharadwaj, uh, who's a professor in the Department of Physics at IIT Kharagpur. Uh, professor Somnath uh, did his PhD uh, in astrophysics from ISC Bangalore in 1996. And before that, he did his integrated MSc in physics from IIT Kharagpur uh, 1998. And he's, uh, as all of, as most of us know, or all of us know, he's very well known for his research in cosmology, large-scale structure formation, and uh, galaxy formation. So, without taking up in taking up any more time, I would request uh, Professor Bharadwaj to please uh, go ahead with his talk on large-scale structure. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this kind uh, invitation to speak here, and uh, for the kind introduction. So uh, let me get started. I uh, uh, let me get started by asking the participants a few questions. I mean, uh, we are in the ninth uh, day of the uh, winter school, and I think it's a ten day. Is it a ten day event or uh, uh, ten eleven days? Right? Yes, sir. Twelve days. Yeah, ten ten days. Uh, Twelve days. Okay. So I think uh, I mean must you must have been exposed to quite a few uh, lectures. Uh, on uh, uh, observational astronomy and uh, things like that, related issues. Uh, just to get things started, I mean, uh, instead of just you know embarking on a long lecture, uh, I think you have uh, been through many of that, uh, many of those. Uh, let me just ask you. So I am going to some few questions. Okay, so I am going to speak on cosmology, uh, broadly speaking. And uh, do any of you know what uh, this cosmology subject is about? <clears throat> Uh, so you can look in the chat. Uh, oh, in the chat. Okay, okay. Yes, sir. Yes. Uh, now, <laughs> okay. Let me see. I can read it. No, no, no. Uh, uh, what you can do is chat. minimize no it. Okay. Yeah, I've got the chat. Uh, does it also obstruct the screen or? It does. It does, sir. So I can just read it out to you. What do you yeah, think? Okay. Uh, Priyankar Mukherjee says, study of the universe. Shubham Bharadwaj says, uh, study of the universe on a large scale. Right, right. That is correct. Yeah. So in cosmology, we want to study the entire universe uh, as a whole instead of uh, studying individual objects in the universe. Uh, what do we mean by the universe, uh, incidentally? Okay, I think uh, Shubhashish Das probably said this in the in response to your earlier question about cosmos, like beginning of the universe. Mm -hmm. So uh, Priyankar Mukherjee says collection of galaxy clusters. Mm -hmm. That's what we mean by the universe. <clears throat> Any anybody else? Shubham Bhardwaj says uh, structure of the universe. Uh huh. Now, what is the meant by the universe? I mean, that's the question. I'm not seeing any other. OK, OK. OK, fine. So I think that's an uh, I mean, we're going to talk about uh, so uh, so I'm going to talk about probing the large scale structures in the universe with the 21 centimeter line. So by the universe, uh, we mean everything that exists, everything, right? Now, uh, obviously, uh, we are not going to look at the microscopic scales here to, to probe the microscopic scales. It's, a, it's not a astronomy that you do. So we are actually dealing we want to study everything that exists, but we are here going to study it on a large scale. Okay, instead of looking at it at a 
small scale. There are other subjects, other branches of physics, other branches of science, which look at whatever exists on different length scales and from different approaches. Our approach here is on the largest possible scales. Okay. <clears throat> and uh, the work that I have been, I am going to talk about, we have been uh, carrying it out for quite a few years, approximately two decades now. And there have been a lot of collaborators. This is just an old picture of some of the collaborators, the collaborator. And uh, these are some more pictures of some of the collaborators. And there are more collaborators. Uh, whose pictures are not here in these slide, uh, in these two slides which I have shown. Okay, so <clears throat> let me first uh, introduce the idea of the expanding universe. You might have heard about this, learned about this in yesterday's lecture uh, on cosmology also. So <clears throat> when I talk about the expanding universe. Uh, everything that we have in the universe is not expanding. Some things are expanding, right? Not everything. So, uh, let me explain what I mean by this expansion of the universe. Okay. So, imagine that this is a part of the universe. Some part of the space of the universe at a certain time in the past. And we have filled this volume with a grid like this. Okay. Now, this same part of the universe at a later time looks like this. Every object, just imagine that there is an object sitting at every grid point, has moved away from its neighbor. So, as time proceeds, every part of the universe is expanding like this. It is getting larger. The different objects will, which fill up the universe are moving apart. Okay. Now, you may be wondering, is this true at all length scales? Am I getting taller every day? Am I getting fatter every day? Yes or no? What do you think is the answer? Or is my dimension fixed? This is only on certain length scale. Just waiting for the responses. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think it's uh, only in some uh, cosmological length scale. Right. So my body is not expanding. My nose is not getting longer every day. My eyes are not getting longer. Uh, neither is the distance between each of us increasing. <clears throat> right. It is only on some very large scale. So you can think of the galaxies. I'm sure you've had lectures on galaxies. There are galaxies all over the universe. And you may think that the space the gap between these galaxies is increasing with time. Okay. So this is one aspect of the expanding universe. As time evolves, a volume of the universe like this, which you see on the right-hand side, expands and becomes a volume like this. The density of matter inside goes down and the spacing between these objects goes up. This is one aspect of the expanding universe. The other aspect of the expanding universe is as follows. It is shown by the picture here. Imagine that there is an observer here and there is a source of light located at a distance. There is a source located at a distance. O is the observer. S is the source. And there is light of a certain wavelength, lambda emitted, which is emitted by the source. Because of the expansion of the universe, sorry, this keeps on changing. Because of the expansion of the universe, as the light propagates to the observer, the wavelength of the light increases. Okay. 
This is another consequence of the expanding universe. And the wavelength, new wavelength, which is observed, is lambda emitted. And the factor by which it increases, I have denoted here. So lambda emitted is the factor by which there's the wavelength at which the light was emitted. Lambda observed, lambda O is the wavelength at which the light is observed. 1 plus Z is the factor by which the wavelength gets scaled up. This Z over here is a positive number. The wavelength increases. And this Z is called the redshift. OK. So let me ask you a question. Suppose a one meter wavelength is emitted from here and an observer by an observer and at redshift one. So at what wavelength will the observer at present see it? There is a source. Two meters. Two meters, correct. Right. So that means the redshift one means that the wavelength will become double. Now, the higher the redshift, the further away is the source. Okay, higher the redshift, this is the picture which I have shown in the next slide. This is something that we shall need to keep in mind in this talk. <clears throat> okay, so I am the observer looking out and I am seeing that the light is getting redshifted. So a wavelength, light of wavelength one meter emitted from here is two meters or some factor one plus Z larger when it reaches me. Okay, now a larger redshift means that the light is coming from a further distance. So larger the redshift, the further the distance the light is originating from. That is the first thing. Second thing is that light takes a finite time to travel any distance. So larger the redshift, the further back in past that I am seeing. So this light coming from here must have been emitted earlier as compared to the light coming from here or the light coming from here. So the light from a further object must have been emitted earlier, right? So basically larger redshift means a larger distance from us. It also means that a larger time back in the past, okay? A larger time back in the past. So uh, if we can see objects or if we can see parts of the universe at higher and higher redshifts, we are able to probe things which are further back in time. Not only that, but things which are far away, further away from us. Okay. So I hope that this is clear to everybody because the whole talk hinges upon this. Okay. Higher redshift means further away and further back in time. Okay, so it's kind of time travel. We are studying the past. We are studying the history of the universe. Okay. Right. Now, let me tell you about this 21 centimeter radiation. So I'm going to discuss how we can probe the large scale structures in the universe using 21 centimeter radiation. So what is this 21 centimeter radiation? Let me first, let me next tell you that. <clears throat> so let us consider hydrogen atom, neutral hydrogen, which in spectroscopic parlance, spectroscopic jargon is called H1. H1, this is the Roman number one, okay, H1. Neutral hydrogen atom. Okay, now in the ground state of the atom, that is we have the electron and the proton in S, 1s orbital, the pro electron in the 1s state, we still have one degree of freedom left, that is the spin. Now you see there are different possible spin states which are related through a spin-flip transition. 
loosely speaking the two electron and the proton spins may be aligned or they may be counter aligned actually it is not exactly this but loosely speaking you can think of it like this and there can be a transition between this these two states where the electron spin flips there is a small energy difference between these two states this is called a hyperfine transition and this small energy difference gives rise to radiation at 1420 megahertz or 21 centimeters okay so this is the 21 centimeter radiation that i'm talking about where does it originate from just to make sure we all understand what we are talking about Uh, from the spin flip of the neutral hydrogen atom right spin flip of the neutral hydrogen atom in the ground state okay very good and if the hydrogen is far away then the radiation will get red shifted and i will see it at a different frequency the frequency will be smaller by a factor one plus z where z is the red shift or the wavelength will be larger by a factor one plus z so the wavelength will be larger. So if I see this radiation at a larger wavelength, I can infer the redshift. Okay, I can infer the redshift and I know then that from what distance it is coming. And I can also work out at, from what, at what time back in the past it was emitted. So it will appear at a smaller frequency or larger wavelength if it is coming from a cosmological distance. Okay. So this is the important thing to bear in mind. Now, why are we so concerned about hydrogen? Okay. <clears throat> so to get an appreciation for this, let us look at what are the constituents of the universe what we believe now are the constituents of the universe okay so we believe that at present the universe approximately 70 percent of the universe is made up of some substance called dark energy which we don't know what it is okay but it has a name and it some of its properties are known so the name is a mysterious name dark energy and we know some of its properties but very little is known about this but we believe that it makes up 70 percent of the universe okay there is evidence that it makes up 70 percent of the universe of the remaining 30 percent 26 percent is made up of something called dark matter which again whose properties are different from that of dark energy okay this also we don't know really what it is but we know it is there, there is evidence, and uh, it, we believe that it makes up approximately 26%. These numbers could be slightly off, but approximately 26% of the universe is made up of this dark matter. And only 4% is made up of the baryons. So by baryons, what we mean are the neutrons and protons. The electrons are there, but they don't contribute much to the density of the universe. Right, the universe is neutral, so we know that the electrons are there, but the protons and neutrons are what constitute the density, and uh, they constitute only 4% of the universe. So only 4%, all the theories of particle physics, the standard model, etc., they account primarily for 4% of the universe. Okay these particles. Of this 4%, 75% is hydrogen and 25% is helium. You may be wondering what about the rest of the things we learn in physics and chemistry, right? They are there, but they are much smaller. I mean, it's not really 75 and 25. There is a small, there is a small <coughs> deficit, which is made up, which uh, the other things make up right and in astrophysics in astronomy we refer to anything beyond hydrogen and helium as a metal okay so these metals 
these heavier elements make up a very small fraction of the universe. Okay. The constitution of Earth is not like this. Okay, it's quite different. But if you look at the universe as a whole, this is what the constitution looks like. Okay, of the known substances, 75% of the universe is hydrogen. Right, the others are primarily unknown. So, 96% per, of the universe, we really don't know what it is. Okay, of the known 4%, 75% is hydrogen. So, hydrogen is the most abundant known substance in the universe. Okay, so it is there all over the universe. So, this 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen is a good, is potentially a good way of studying the universe. Okay. Now, let me uh, do a little bit of uh, mathematics and uh, bring in some physics also here. So, you see, I have told you that uh, the uh, hydrogen atom can have two states. The excited, the hyperfine, there are two hyperfine, the hyperfine splitting makes the ground state have two states. And the number density of particles in these two states, that is in the excited state corresponding to this N1, and the ground state corresponding to N0, we quantify this using this Boltzmann factor here, which is possibly familiar to you already. You must have studied the Boltzmann distribution, Maxwell Boltzmann distribution. Right. G1 here is the degeneracy of the excited state and G0 is the degeneracy of the ground state. The excited state is a triplet, so it has a degeneracy of 3. The ground state is a singlet, it has a degeneracy of 1. So this factor is 3, this factor is 1. T star is H nu by the Boltzmann factor. Nu is 1420 megahertz, this is the Planck constant. So this ratio is denoted by T star and it has a value 0 0.068 Kelvin. This is how we define the spin temperature. So the spin temperature is a way of quantifying this ratio. How many are there in the excited state? How many are there in the ground state of this transition? Okay. And it turns out that the spin temperature is a convenient way very useful and convenient way of quantifying this ratio of number of atoms in this state to the number of atoms in this state. Okay. <clears throat> and let me also introduce a, another constituent of the universe about which I think you would have heard in more detail yesterday. This is the cosmic microwave background radiation. So, since you have heard about it yesterday, maybe some of you can tell what, what is it? What is this cosmic microwave background radiation? How do we know it is there? So, uh, I think it is the uniform and isotropic radiation in microwave uh, wavelength. Uh, uh, for uh, it's like the first light of the uh, universe, I think. No, no, you tell me what do you see? Oh, um, it, it's like a black body spectrum. A black body spectrum, yes. Yeah, so you take a radio meter, you take a radio meter which can measure the radio radiation coming and you point it in any direction, you will get what do you mean by isotropic? Uh, it's the same in all directions. It will be same. You will get the same radiation coming from all directions. So, sitting on the earth, you take a radiometer and you point it in different directions. You will see that there is this radiation coming from all directions. Right. And we believe that this radiation, okay, so it is observed at a great level of accuracy that this is a black body spectrum with a temperature of CPO 2.73 Kelvin. And we believe that this radiation fills the entire universe. It is not something produced locally. It is something cosmological. That is, this radiation fills the entire universe. 
right we are sitting here and seeing it but we believe that it is there everywhere in the universe it fills the entire universe okay and this radiation so it is coming to us and it is filling the entire universe now as you go to higher and higher red shifts right at present we'll just summarize this so there is a radiation coming to us at a temperature of 2.73 kelvin it's a black body spectrum at a temperature of 2.73 kelvin now i am sitting here and observing this radiation if i go further out right if i go further and further away means i'm going into the past right if i go into the past the frequency of this radiation each photon in this radiation was smaller the wave larger the wavelength was smaller so the whole temperature also increases so with redshift if i go to higher and higher redshifts the temperature of this radiation increases as 1 plus z okay higher and higher redshift means larger distance by the time you are at a redshift of 1000 will be the temperature uh, somewhere around 2700 kelvin right right and that is a large distance from us way back in the past isn't it Higher redshift means further distance and way back in the past. So sometime way back in the past at a large distance from us, this radiation was hot enough it is to have ionized the entire universe. And before this, the universe was ionized, completely ionized. So further beyond this, the universe was completely ionized. And this is the Big Bang where the universe is believed to have originated. We cannot go further beyond that. Okay. So if you follow these photons which are coming to us to higher and higher redshift at a certain redshift of 1000, around 1000, this radiation was sufficiently hot to have ionized the whole universe. And once the universe is ionized, it is opaque. Right? The universe around us is transparent. That's why you can do astronomy. Right? If the universe was opaque, could you do astronomy? No, we wouldn't no. have any photons. <laughs> right, we would not have light coming to us from far away. So the universe is transparent, but it stops being transparent at a redshift above 1000. Okay. So at a redshift above 1000, the universe becomes opaque. I cannot see any further beyond a redshift of 1000. So the cosmic microwave background radiation that we are seeing originated from a redshift of 1000, from a sphere like this at a redshift of 1000. And it has small anisotropies, which uh, are of the order of few tens of micro Kelvin. Right. So we are seeing the sphere here, where the universe got opaque, essentially. Okay. So basically, what I have told you is that the universe is filled with the radiation at a temperature which is now 2.73 Kelvin. And if you go back in the past, the temperature, the radiation is hotter and hotter. By a redshift of thousand, the radiation is hot enough to have ionized the universe. Okay. With this, we can now jump into discussing our topic, which I am, which I, which is there in the title of this talk. Right. So I am. So we are now in a position to get some idea of how we can use this twenty-one centimeter radiation to study the large-scale structures in the universe. Okay, and since this is a school in on observational astronomy, this is an observational picture that I have put. Observational means it kind of tells you what you expect to see, what you expect to observe, right? So this is the observer sitting here. Oh, the observer is looking in this direction. Here, in this direction. Now, on this axis, I have plotted redshift, Z. Okay. So, what does larger redshift mean? <clears throat> redshift is increasing. 
larger okay. sessions would mean uh, we would larger, at talking about older time older time and larger distance right because the light takes time to propagate from here to here so uh, so we are looking at larger distance and older times right and this when you hit a redshift of 1000 <clears throat> at redshifts above 1000 what can you say i just told you The universe is dark. Universe is ionized. Right? The CMBR temperature at this redshift of 1000, how much is it? Uh, 2700 Kelvin. 2700, around 3000 Kelvin. Right? That is hot enough to have ionized all the hydrogen in the universe. All the hydrogen in the universe was ionized at redshift above 1000. Okay. So there is no question of receiving 21 centimeter radiation from a redshift above 1000 because the universe was ionized. There was no neutral hydrogen. And once the universe is ionized, the photons, the CMBR photons, these photons cannot travel much distance. So they will, this shows you a typical path. So they will move some distance and then they will undergo a scattering from the ionized particle. And again, they will move some distance, another scattering. So they will get kicked around. The photons cannot move a large distance. Okay. Once the universe is at a redshift of 1000, what happens? The universe becomes neutral. Once the universe becomes neutral, two things happen. What happens to the hydrogen? It becomes neutral. Once the universe becomes neutral, the cosmic microwave background radiation is no longer scattered. The scattering takes place only in the ionized medium. In a neutral medium, it passes straight through this and comes to us. Okay. Now, the point is that it travels to us through this hydrogen, neutral hydrogen. Okay. So, the neutral hydrogen here at redshift below 1000, there is neutral hydrogen, which can either emit or absorb at 21 centimeter. And the CMBR photons are traveling to us through this 21 centimeter, the, through this hydrogen. So it will interact with this hydrogen hyd hyperfine transition. And this is what we are studying. Okay. The propagation of the CMBR through the hyd neutral hydrogen. Okay. Now, what happens? It depends on this. So the CMBR has a temperature, as I told you, which is changing with redshift, T gamma. And the CMBR is coming to us, cosmic microwave background radiation is coming to us through this neutral hydrogen. So the hydrogen also has a temperature, which is the spin temperature. It tells me how many atoms are in the excited state of the hyperfine transition, how many are in the ground state, this ratio. Now, when the CMBR photons are coming through this hydrogen, right, it will 21 centimeter transition will be will possibly be imprinted on the CMBR and the nature of the interaction will depend on whether the T spin is more than T gamma or T spin is less than T gamma. What do you expect if T spin is less than T gamma? <clears throat> you can guess. <laughs> So when radiation propagates through matter, what happens through, say, atom? <clears throat> what happens? It will absorb or emit at 21 centimeters, this line, this wavelength. Now, question is, will there be absorption or will there be emission? Yes, what do you guess? So I guess uh, if TS is greater than T gamma, it, yeah. it will be emission and... Right. If TS is less than T gamma, there will be yeah. absorption. Emission. emission. Right. So you will see emission or absorption depending on the values of TS and T gamma. Right. And if they are same, nothing will happen. Right. That's the thermodynamics law. Right. So fine. So this 
what happens when it propagates when the cmbr photons propagate through the neutral hydrogen there can be so in the absence of this neutral hydrogen <clears throat> right there will be it will come straight to us there will be no interaction with this but because of the neutral hydrogen there can be absorption or emission and that can be different along different lines of sight along these different directions okay at which frequency will it be will the absorption take place or emission take place it will be corresponding to the 21 centimeter wave ah 1420 megahertz right but 1420 megahertz from a redshift of 6 when it comes to us at what frequency will we see it this is what is shown over here so 1420 from this redshift of 6 when it reaches us it will be at what frequency 200 200, yeah. 200. so if right so if you see an absorption or emission at 200 megahertz you will know that it is due to neutral hydrogen at a redshift of 6 right 1420 is where the transition takes place so it will cause an effect at 1420 but it will get redshifted to this 200 megahertz when it reaches us so as you go further to higher and higher redshift the frequency decreases okay if the hydrogen is just where we are it will be 1420 okay so hydrogen at different redshifts will produce features at different frequencies in the cmbr and what you see are the brightness temperature what you measure is the brightness temperature of the cmbr this is the fluctuations in the brightness temperature okay i will not define these things but basically you can kind of visualize you will see fluctuations in the temperature of the cmbr due to this hydrogen and these fluctuations will be different in different directions they will also be different at different frequencies depending on what is happening in the hydrogen okay and this is how it is defined okay you, you subtract so the difference relative to the background cmbr okay this is what you will see and this is the formula for the brightness temperature fluctuations i will not go into the details of this but the point is this factor over here if T gamma is less than T spin, if T gamma is less than T spin, what will happen? What about this factor? So T spin is more. What, what about this factor? It One will be positive. It will be positive. You will see emission. Right. Spin temperature is more than the CMB temperature. If T gamma is greater than spin, spin temperature, what will happen? It will be negative and it will be negative. negative. And right, you will get absorption. Right, you will get absorption. So, this is the basic point. Okay. Right, let me not go into the details of all of these things. Okay, so this is what is mentioned here. Okay. So, depending on those relative, uh, the, the, the values of T spin and T gamma, you can have absorption or emission along at so at different frequencies, right? So here this corresponds to a frequency of 200. And you may have emission here, absorption here, right? Depending on the spin temperature at different points uh, along the line of sight. Okay. So each frequency is a different distance, and then you have the direction. So you can basically do a three-dimensional mapping using this. Okay. This is the 21 centimeter signal. And all of this is in very low frequencies. This is the part of the spectrum. So it is not in this part of the spectrum, which is basically where the CMBR is measured. Right? It is in this very low frequency part of the spectrum, which is not measured here. Okay. It's in the very low frequency part of the spectrum. Okay. Now, let us look at the evolution of the neutral hydrogen. Uh, will you please tell me when the time is up? I am just going through these slides one by one. Okay, uh, kindly please tell me when the when I when I am supposed to stop. Okay, okay. Now you see the universe first became neutral at a redshift of one thousand, right? That is where the universe first became neutral, and at this redshift. 
there are no stars or galaxies so whatever observational astronomy you are talking about what are the things that we have learned which you can observe in astronomy you can observe <coughs> stars galaxies right quasars black holes etc uh, most of these things did not exist at these large redshifts larger than 30 right between 30 and 1000 you could not there were these objects had not formed okay there were no sources of light at these redshifts so early in the universe this is referred to as the dark age of the universe right now during so this is a redshift above 30 so redshift say 30 to 50 okay around 30 to 1000 now during this epoch the dark ages there were no luminous sources and the neutral hydrogen basically traces the matter distribution and there is a small region over here which you can see where the spin temperature falls below the cmb temperature so what happens if the spin temperature falls below the cmb temperature the neutral hydrogen will be seen in absorption against the cosmic microwave background radiation in this redshift range okay now once you hit a redshift of around 30 something very interesting starts to happen right and this is what is called the epoch of reionization well there are more details you can have other names for the early part and later part but broadly speaking this is the epoch of reionization right what is it that happens here you can see that all kinds of very interesting things are happening here let me explain this okay so the point is that if you look at the universe at a very high redshift what is the observation that probes a very high redshift redshift of thousand I just told you, you have heard a lecture on it. What is it? It's shown on the left hand side of this figure of this uh, slide. Yeah, we are supposed to uh, observe the uh, cosmic microwave background. Right. That we are not supposed to. That is the only observation yes. by and large that probes those high redshifts, right? Of the order of thousand, redshift of around thousand. That is the only observation by and large, right? And what we see is that the universe is more or less isotropic. It is the same everywhere except for tiny fluctuations in the temperature. Right. One part in 10 to the power 5. That is the order of magnitude of these fluctuations. At a redshift of 1000. You have also learned about the nearby universe. What do you see in the nearby universe? The whole. Right. What do you see in the nearby universe? What is it that you do in observational astronomy? What is it that you observe? It's galaxies and stars. And galaxies and stars. Quasars. Right. So in the nearby universe, you see galaxies. A galaxy is not a very small disturbance. It's not a very small fluctuation. It's a very large fluctuation in the density of the universe. Okay. Not only that, these galaxies themselves, as you can see here, right? they show this very complex each point in this picture is a galaxy each point in this picture is a galaxy okay this is redshift okay this is redshift you can see it's very small redshifts we are talking about right nearby universe and this is angle so this shows you the distribution of galaxies in a part of the nearby universe you can see that this distribution is not homogeneous and I said not very smooth. There are large fluctuations. You can see that there is something called the cosmic web. You can see that there are all kinds of filaments, voids, a very complicated network like pattern that you can see. Right. So the point is that you have these very smooth, tiny flu uh, fluctuation, uh, very smooth uh, this universe at a high redshift with tiny fluctuations. And in the nearby universe, you have these very large fluctuations in the matter distribution. 
question is how did the universe evolve from this very smooth state to this kind of a state where you have large uh, bound objects like galaxies and the galaxies themselves show this very interesting pattern so we believe that this occurs by the process of gravitational instability what is this process of gravitational instability you see there are these tiny fluctuations here so the some parts of the universe are hotter or the density is slightly larger some part are cooler the density is slightly smaller these fluctuations they grow why do they grow because the over dense regions where the density is larger than the average of the universe they attract matter from elsewhere and the under dense regions they lose matter to the over dense regions so these fluctuations they grow this process is called gravitational instability and this process is dominated by dark matter the dynamics of this process we believe is dominated by the dark matter which you can't see okay the baryons kind of follow this okay further the current theoretical understanding of this process tells us that as these density fluctuations grow you will first form small halos like this small bound objects small objects first these small objects will merge to form larger objects which in turn will form merge to form even larger objects this picture is called hierarchical clustering right so you have clustering going on gravitational instability is what is causing clustering and you form small objects first and then you form larger objects and even still larger objects so you could have formed small galaxies first these merge to form larger galaxies and finally this is what you get the kind of pattern that you see behind okay this is what how we believe that structure formation has taken place in the universe okay now what happens <clears throat> so you see you form these dark matter halos which i have shown in the picture here you form these dark matter halos here okay by this hierarchical clustering right and the baryons they flow into these halos right they condense in these halos and this is what gives rise to galaxies now these baryons they said they form the first luminous objects at a redshift of around let us say 30 right and when you form these first objects they emit copious amounts of ultraviolet radiation so you form very massive stars you also form black holes and these emit ultraviolet radiation at frequencies greater than 13.6 electron volts which can ionize the neutral hydrogen. So the first stars form within these dark matter halos, which grow by the process of gravitational instability. They emit cop copious amounts of ultraviolet radiation, which ionizes the universe. <clears throat> right. And you form ionized bubbles like this around the first bright objects that are formed. And these bubbles grow and they overlap. And then the whole universe is ionized by a redshift of 6. So the whole thing starts around the redshift of 30. And between the redshift of 15 to 6, the whole universe was ionized. Okay. This is called the epoch of reionization. So first we had the dark ages. Then we have the situation where the ionized is, the hydrogen is ionized again. So this video, which uh, we have made, shows you this reionization process so you can see that you're forming so the left hand size side shows the hydrogen distribution the right hand side shows you the first luminous objects which are being formed so these objects are formed by gravitational instability and they emit radiation and this radiation produces ionized bubbles these ionized bubbles merge and they grow and finally the entire universe is ionized okay this is the epoch of reionization. The same thing. Let me skip through this. Okay. So here you see that the hydrogen gets patchy. You have these bubbles in the hydrogen. You have small bubbles. They merge. And finally, the whole universe is ionized. 
Okay. By a redshift of six, the entire universe is ionized. The diffuse hydrogen in the entire universe is ionized. Okay. After a redshift of six, you have the post reionization era. So, redshift of six to zero, you have the post reionization era. There still is the entire diffuse intergalactic medium. So, there is a medium between the galaxies, the hydrogen is ionized. But there are these small clumps which you can see in this picture, right, which contain hydrogen. You can think of them as the galaxies. The galaxies themselves have still contain small hydrogen which can withstand the ionization, reionization process. Okay. And we know that these things exist because you can see them in absorption against quasars. They are known as the damped Lyman alpha clouds. Okay. So, the hydrogen in these small clumps, the galaxies, they emit neutral hydrogen and we can see the collective radiation from this neutral hydrogen in these small clumps. So, between a redshift of 6 to 0, the 21 centimeter radiation traces essentially the distribution of the galaxies in the universe. Okay. So this picture shows you, let me, this is a video which shows you the 21 centimeter radiation at how it evolves from a redshift of 6 to a redshift of 0, right. So you can see that the hydrogen traces what is called the cosmic web, the same kind of pattern which you saw in the galaxy distribution filaments surrounding voids. And as the redshift gets lower, as the universe evolves, the matter distribution gets more and more clumpy. And uh, you see, you form larger density contrasts and uh, the matter clustering in increases. And this is the kind of 21 centimeter signal that you expect to see at low redshifts. So, at low red shifts, the 21 centimeter radiation allows you to probe large scale structure formation in the universe. Okay. So, let me just summarize. Okay, we shall come to this. Okay. Now, what do we observe here? 21 centimeter radiation. All right. What do we observe? So, what you observe are the brightness temperature fluctuations with frequency and angle on the sky. So, this is some representative picture of what you expect to observe at a given frequency. Okay. And this whole thing will vary with frequency because each frequency corresponds to a different distance. Okay. So, you expect to see fluctuations in the brightness temperature of the 21 centimeter of the CMBR of 21 centimeter radiation, essentially. Right. Now, <clears throat> What we do in cosmology is that we decompose these fluctuations into Fourier modes. Right. And then we look at the square of the amplitude of these Fourier modes. So, this is a function of the wave number k, and this is what is called the power spectrum. So, it essentially tells us the amplitude of the fluctuations at different k, at different wave numbers. Okay, this is what is called the power spectrum. And this is a picture which shows you some 21 centimeter power spectrum. Okay. So, the power spectrum is the quantity of interest in large, quantifying the large scale structures in the universe. And there has been quite a lot of effort in measuring the power spectrum. This is an ongoing pro thing. So, there are a lot of experiments, a lot of observations which keep on measuring the power spectrum to greater and greater detail and there is a lot of cosmology which you can do things about the universe which you can tell by measuring the power spectrum right so here you can see that there is a there are large variety of observations the largest scales are probed from the cosmic microwave background radiation then you have the galaxy surveys lyman alpha forest a wide variety of observations have gone in into this picture which shows you the power spectrum of the matter distribution in the universe. So, the 21 centimeter radiation is another probe which we expect will tell us 
allow us to measure this power spectrum of matter fluctuations in the universe. Okay. So let me now uh, summarize what I have told you till now, and then I will move on again. Okay. So the point is, yes. Oh, then I will stop there. Okay. So good. So I will roughly give you half the talk which I had. Okay. No problem. <clears throat> right. So let me summarize here. Okay. Fine. So what have I told you? I have told you about uh, how we can uh, explore the universe with the redshift with this 21 centimeter radiation and the 21 centimeter radi the it originates from neutral hydrogen this 21 centimeter radiation hydrogen first became neutral at a redshift of 1000 and we know that at a redshift of 1000 there were tiny fluctuations in the universe which you can see here the cosmic microwave background probes this, right? And then there are observations of the universe in the local neighborhood, the galaxy surveys, <clears throat> which allow us to probe the distribution of matter in the local universe to a great level of accuracy. There are several observational probes <laughs> which work in this redshift range but they are none of them are you know extensive like allow us to extensively probe this large region of the universe neutral hydrogen the 21 centimeter radiation from neutral hydrogen allows us to probe this large redshift range here from a redshift of around 200 all the way to a redshift of around zero. We can study this entire range of region of the universe using the redshifted 21 centimeter radiation. Right. There are this roughly three epochs which I have told you about. Right. So there is the dark age, redshift around 50, where we can probe, possibly probe the universe in absorption and studies here will allow us to probe the primordial power spectrum, primordial non-Gaussianity, which are very interesting issues in cosmology. Then once you hit a redshift of around 30, you form the first luminous objects. You have the epoch of reionization. And by studying this, you can study the first stars, galaxy formation, and how the hydrogen in the universe was again ionized. Hyd hydrogen first became neutral at a redshift of 1000, but by a redshift of 6, it was ionized again. And then I told you about the post reionization era, where the 21 centimeter radiation traces the dark matter distribution. You can study the baryon acoustic oscillations, right? How galaxies are assembled and cosmic level. Okay. Now, uh, there is a whole part of the talk which I'm not going into, which is some of the ob observational efforts which we have been doing. But I think uh, I have told you uh, some things and I will stop here and take questions if there are any. Thank you very much. Sir. Uh, so, are there any questions? Please raise your hand. Sure. Let's go ahead. Yes. Uh, thanks for the very enlightening talk. And uh, my uh, question is that in the current power spectrum image that you showed, uh, what does the peak indicate? The peak, uh, the hump that we saw. Uh, now this, the the hump here. Yes. Yes. Uh, this corresponds to the Fourier mode which entered the universe at the epoch. See, the universe has something called the horizon. Okay, so that is, see, the, the in the present model of cosmology, there is a finite lifetime of the universe, right? Yes, yes. So the light can only propagate a certain distance in this lifetime, in this lifetime. Yes. And every day we are seeing further and further because the, the lifetime is increasing. Right, right. Right. So in the past, this distance would have been smaller. Yes. 
Now there in the past of the universe, there was a transition when the universe was matter dom radiation dominated. At one time, the CMBR dominated the universe. Okay. Okay. And now we know. I have told you that the dark matter is the twenty-five percent, right? Yes. So at some point there was a transition between CMB and dark matter. This is the Fourier mode which entered the horizon, which whose length? See, this this is basically inverse length. Okay. 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 Wave number. So this is the inverse of the length scale, where the inverse where corresponds to a length scale, which is the horizon at size at the epoch when the radiation matter transition took place. Okay, so this this basically corresponds to the transition from radiation dominated to matter dominated universe. Okay. Okay, sir. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> um, yes. Hello. Yes. Hello. Uh, um, thank you for the talk, sir. Um, I wanted to ask, uh, how did the neutral hydrogen in the galaxies that we see at lower redshifts? How did those uh, clumps of neutral hydrogen survive the epoch of reionization? Right. So the density there is larger, right? Okay. So they can uh, shield themselves against the uh, the radiation which is ionizing it. Okay, sir. And sir, okay. you mentioned something called uh, primordial non-Gaussianity of the. Right, right, right. What do you mean by that? Well, it is in the see the fluctuations that give rise to structure formation, right? They are. It is believed that they were formed by a process, some process called inflation, which took place much earlier than what we are studying. Okay. The time scales. Okay. Now, in the simplest model of inflation, the fluctuations are believed to be a Gaussian random field. Okay. Okay, but it need not be so. So there are models where there are primordial non-Gaussianities. There are. It is not exactly not okay. okay. Gaussian, and this is what you can study that okay. if you study the power spectrum. That's a very high redshift. Okay, sir. Thank you. Any other questions? Please raise your hand. You can type in the chat box as well if you have facing any difficulty. Is there any further question? Let's wait for one moment more. Okay, it sounds like there are no further questions. Uh, thank you, Professor Barakash, for this. Yeah. Yeah, thank time. you very much. Yeah.
we are just waiting for the next speaker to join please stay on the uh you'll be joining in a moment Hello. Hello. Hello, Dr. Varavan. Ah, yeah, Manonita. Yeah, yeah. Am Hello. I audible? Welcome. Fine, no? Yeah, yeah. You are okay. clearly audible. Yeah, no problem. Uh, yeah. Uh, if you want, you can put up the slides and we can test it whether everything is working or not. Okay. Just a minute. Huh? Yeah, sure. Uh, can you see? Sorry, I was uh, on mute. Uh, yeah, it's oh. perfectly visible. Okay, fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, let's just wait for five more minutes and then. No, no we'll problem. Go. Sure. Oh, thanks.
Okay, I think we can uh, start now. I will just <clears throat> give a brief introduction of our second speaker of the day. So it's an immense pleasure to welcome uh, Dr. Rale to give a lecture in as a part of this uh, Meta School. Uh, Dr. Varahwade is a uh, faculty at the Physical Research Laboratory, Ahmedabad, and <clears throat> he did his PhD in X-ray astronomy from TIFR Mumbai in 2003. His research interest lies in the field of X-ray astronomy, primarily focusing on black hole binaries and black holes. Uh, he has also been extensively involved in developing various instrumentation for in X-rays, particularly he has worked a lot uh, in on the Indian multi wavelength mission Astrosat, especially extra detectors. So it will be a very uh, great pleasure to hear from Dr. Varavale. So with that, I leave the field to Dr. Varavale. Over to you. Hello, am I audible? Yeah, you are audible. Yeah. So thank you, Manonita, for nice introduction. And thank you, uh, Dr. Datta, for uh, your invitation to give this talk. Uh, in this school. Uh, I would like to begin uh, with uh, saying that uh, this is a kind of uh, uh, opportunity which I have been looking, but somehow we are missing to interact with the students. And so it is like a, a very good opportunity for last uh, quite some time. Uh, we have not been able to do that. It would have been very nice to have this lecture face to face. But in the current condition, I think uh, this is the best alternative. Uh, since I have been sort of asked to give this lecture on techniques, particularly telescopes, it will be more like on an instrument side. Uh, anyway, this is the last uh, towards the end of the school. So I suppose all the participants are sort of familiar with the various astrophysical uh, sources, which we I mean, I might uh, discuss in between on and off. So I won't give introduction to all. Uh, those sources or the various uh, uh, phenomena uh, in X-rays, which are uh, giving X-rays, because I assume that uh, you must have heard from various lectures throughout last uh, 10 days. So uh, just to give a brief outline, I mean, what I would start with, uh, uh, I will just set a stage to come uh, uh, to the uh, discussions of our X-ray measurements, how they are measured and how uh, the various detectors and instrument works. So before that, I will uh, uh, define some basic definitions and then quickly go through some of the processes. Why it is important? It is just to emphasize that when we are talking about X-rays, that means essentially we are talking about uh, extreme physical conditions in the uh, universe. And uh, these are sort of available only on the specific sources, compact objects, which I am sure by now you are all familiar with. And then I will just uh, start with the brief history uh, and then move on to the actual uh, uh, techniques of how we detect and how we measure X-rays. Uh, briefly touch upon AstroSat. I won't spend too much time because again, I assume that you would all be familiar with AstroSat and end with a little one slide introduction of what we are thinking to go beyond AstroSat. Uh, I would also like to mention uh, that uh, it would have been very good uh, because since this covers a very broad range, uh, I assume uh, most of you would be sort of familiar with some of the terms which might I might end up using. If not, if you have any question in between, you can uh, ask uh, either uh, uh, in terms of by writing or maybe even if you are unmuting and asking, it's fine because it would it would be good actually to have it in a more interactive way. So to start with, uh, just when I'm when you are talking about. X-ray astronomy, astronomical X-rays, you all are familiar with uh, this uh, uh, broad uh, electromagnetic wavelength uh, uh, band. Uh, when we talk about X-rays from astronomical sources, essentially uh, what we are interested in is uh, this particular, uh, okay, my pointer is visible. I will just. Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah, there this. So, uh, uh, I mean, what we are interested is in roughly 10 nanometer to uh, sort of a 0.1 angstrom kind of a wave, uh, a wavelength. Uh, more traditional unit is actually energy unit because when we talk about X-ray astronomy, we, uh, uh, unlike uh, your optical or uh, radio radio uh, uh, astronomy, typically people talk in terms of frequency, whereas in optical or IR, it is like more in wavelength. 
but in x-ray astronomy it is generally preferred to uh, talk in the units of energy which is uh, electron volt or kilo electron volt so when i talk about when i say about astrophysical x-rays it's like typically 500 ev to 500 kev uh, again if you are sort of looking at it little carefully right now you would notice that uh, these numbers which i am sort of giving as a lower a lower range or a higher range uh, strictly speaking they are not consistent with each other so for example 10 nanometer is not exactly 10 to the power 17 hertz or that would not be exactly 500 words 500 ev uh, uh, it's it's kind of i have put it purposefully because to just say that these numbers are a very broad uh, range i mean there is no hard and fast boundary at what you start uh, calling it an extreme ultraviolet or at, what, at which frequency you start calling it an x-ray but by and large when i start talk about x-ray it will be uh, sort of uh, confining to this 500 ev to 500 kev Again, this band typically is uh, sort of uh, uh, divided in a soft X-ray, medium X-ray, hard X-rays, uh, which Manonita also mentioned that sort of I have been working on hard X-rays. So uh, there again, uh, that uh, division is uh, not very strict, but usually what people confine is a, uh, uh, anything less than 10 kV is typically considered as a soft X-ray. About 10 kV it is a hard X-ray. So for now, we will stick to this particular uh, uh, definition. Uh, this 10 kV uh, boundary is a kind of important because it comes from some constraints which are coming from an instrument side, which we will discuss as we go along. So the soft and hard is a kind of uh, important uh, uh, distinction to make uh, in, in, in this definition. So uh, we, will we will see that, discuss that more as we go along. Another point to remember here is that uh, we are talking about individual photons now. Each photon is about 1000 times more energetic than an optical photon. So uh, essentially, we are in dealing with individual photons. Uh, and so it's like we are working with uh, particle natures of, of uh, electromagnetic wave here. By definition, it means that we will have much fewer number of photons. Uh, because even if the, let us say, any source is giving same amount of energy in optical, uh, because the individual photons are much uh, uh, lower energy there, you will get a much larger number of signal. Whereas in X-rays, typically you are always uh, 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 sort of limited by available number of photons. And uh, then uh, uh, another corollary is that uh, you are always kind of uh, limited by background. From where the background comes is also a good question that maybe we'll uh, uh, discuss a little later. I mean, I have not spent uh, too much time and slides on the background aspect but still if there are questions we can uh, discuss later but uh, there are two different types of background which comes uh, either extrinsic that is from uh, cosmic x-ray or versus a lot of instrument themselves generate background so most of the time when we are looking for uh, x-rays from astrophysical sources you have to be careful about uh, background part so uh, that is a basic premise for x-ray astronomy now, uh, just to quickly recap, uh, you all uh, know, I mean, uh, how these X-rays are generated in astrophysical sources. Okay, uh, these are the, uh, in, in case of uh, thermal uh, sources, uh, you know, black body radiation. Uh, I am showing here this plot here where uh, I'm just uh, drawn the black body uh, spectrum for a range of different temperatures, starting from 100 Kelvin to, uh, let's say, uh, 40,000 Kelvin. Uh, you can see that they fall very sharply at higher energies and then uh, none of these even up to 40,000 Kelvin or maybe even if I draw uh, 100,000 Kelvin here, you could see that it would not reach up to X-rays. Uh, this temperature range has been chosen because it is uh, kind of typically uh, known like uh, uh, from 4,000 to around uh, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000 is a kind of a temperature which we know that the different stars have. So very hot stars, typically maximum they have 40,000 Kelvin. So basically, when we are talking about X-rays, you don't expect from a normal stellar sources uh, uh, the kind of X-rays which uh, we are interested. So basically, all the astronomical X-ray emission which we are looking for is essentially from a non-stellar sources, and it, it requires extremely high temperature. I mean, certainly temperature has to be more than a, a, a million Kelvin or typically 10 million Kelvin kind of temperature is, is required. So th th that is what is sort of a beginning to go into the fact that X-ray uh, sources are not our uh, regular uh, stellar sources but more exotic kind of uh, sources uh, 
So black body radiation is applicable when the body is sort of optically thick and it is internally thermalized. But if it is not, I mean, if it is optically thin, even then you would get the similar uh, sort of radiation. Uh, it's uh, basically you are again I might be familiar Bremsstrahlung or periphery free emission. Essentially, it is given by uh, uh, electron which is sort of deaccelerated in a close to a nuclear uh, charge. In this case, again, I mean uh, the Bremsstrahlung emission would occur across the entire wavelength, but the it, X ray emission would occur particularly when the electron velocities are very high, which means again the temperature is very high. So when the temperature, you know, uh, if the temperature of a hot gas is uh, is like of the order of million degree Kelvin, then you would expect a continuum uh, Bremsstrahlung emission. Yes. Uh, another important class of the uh, uh, processes are which are driven by a sort of a particle population. So again, I mean, if we uh, have because of any other uh, uh, processes, which by now you might be familiar, like for example, if we have some uh, relativistic jets where we have uh, 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 plasma moving at very high energies, or there are some shocks, or there is some particle acceleration. Whenever we have highly uh, energetic electrons present, these electrons themselves can act as a source of X-rays by two uh, different uh, uh, mechanisms. One is what we call inter inverse Compton scattering. So I, I presume all of you will be available, uh, familiar with the normal Compton scattering, where uh, uh, typically whatever you learn in your uh, graduate uh, course physics, uh, if an incoming photon interact with a stationary electron, uh, the electron will get some decoil energy and the photon will lose energy if its wavelength increase. It's just our regular Compton scattering. But the same process is actually applicable if the electron is not stationary and let us say electron has a higher energy than uh, photon. In that case, electron can transfer some of its energy to photo, uh, photon and the photon energy will increase. So this is the inverse Compton uh, scattering. And uh, uh, in sort of general astrophysical condition, uh, this is very, very important. Uh, how, what would be the sort of spectrum for the uh, extra emission generated from in inverse Compton scattering is a, is a very vast topic and very vast subject. There are entire uh, books written on it. But essentially, it again will uh, depend on uh, the spectrum of the electrons and the spectrum of the seed photons and how uh, they are uh, uh, interplay between each other and how uh, you will get a resultant spectrum. It's, it's a very important uh, topic. And also, it, it gives a lot of insights into the underlying uh, particle uh, population. So uh, inverse Compton scattering is very important uh, from uh, normal, I mean, our astrophysical sense. Uh, the other part. When there is a relativistic electrons present, uh, if there is a magnetic field present, I mean, again, you know that magnetic fields are ubiquitous and across the entire universe. At many places, they are weak and many places, they are very strong. If uh, there is a, a reasonably strong magnetic field present and there is a population of relativistic electrons, you do expect a synchrotron emission by the electrons which are gyrating across the magnetic field line. Uh, again, uh, electrons, individual uh, uh, electron from a given uh, energy, uh, it is a kind of, it shows uh, this type of spectrum. I, I am sure you must have studied it in your textbook. But normally in a astrophysical scenario, what we expect is the uh, electrons have a power law uh, spectrum. So as a result, uh, synchrotron emission also is typically uh, expected to be a power law. So uh, whenever you see a long power law which is not having cut off uh, synchrotron emission is one of the uh, a very important contender and then uh, it, it can use uh, insights in terms of what could be the magnetic field present at the sources so uh, basically uh, what what i uh, uh, so what i was wanted to convey here is that essentially we are looking for conditions which are extreme in terms of this physical condition which is temperature we require more than million kelvin uh, which is difficult to find. I mean, we know that, okay, in a uh, center or core of the stars, you have, of course, have much higher temperature, but outside stars, visible temperature uh, being of the order of million Kelvin or more, uh, where do we expect? Uh, similarly, ma magnetic field, is, uh, we require extremely high magnetic field of the order of maybe 10 to power 10 Gauss, 12 Gauss. Uh, gravitational field right now, it has not come into uh, this process discussion, but I think uh, it, it comes when you consider in terms of the sources where it from where you get the temperature and magnetic field. So uh, these conditions are only possible when we are talking about some of the most exotic objects, uh, like the compact object where 
the mass is concentrated uh, uh, in a much smaller volume compared to what we expect from a normal stellar mass. So like uh, typical examples, black holes, neutron stars, white dwarfs, Okay, supernovae are again. I mean, they are not one particular object, but then the process of the supernova and then the what is uh, remnant of that uh, active galactic nuclei. Again, you know, active galactic nuclei essentially harbor uh, supermassive black holes. Uh, gamma ray bursts. Again, uh, you would have heard gamma ray bursts also over last, I think, yesterday. Uh, that is, uh, these are sort of considered to be a progenitor of black holes. So these are all very exotic phenomena high energy phenomenon which we sort of study in x-ray astronomy so it, it's it's from a uh, uh, physics point of view it's, it's extremely interesting uh, topic another point which we need to keep in mind here is that in most of the cases whatever emission mechanism which discussed they are essentially a uh, continuum emission so uh, what we are dealing here with a multiple uh, maybe either single one component or maybe more than one component, but all of them are sort of not having very sharp features, particularly in harder X-rays. Below 10 keV, there are some uh, uh, atomic lines which are important, but again, these atomic lines can uh, arise only when you have very high temperature. But primarily, when we talk about X-ray uh, astronomy or let us say X-ray spectroscopy, we are dealing with uh, 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 continuum emission, continuum spectroscopy, and then along with that, we have to sort of consider uh, any lines if they are present. So, uh, and and then the, again, I mean, uh, I, I'm not going into the physics of all these sources, but basically what uh, the key ingredients of the basic X-ray universe from, because of which we have all the, all X-rays or entire subject which we are studying today is essentially these are the compact object which we discussed. And then the process of accretion, accretion of matter on the compact object. So this is what gives rise. So uh, uh, you must have uh, heard about all uh, this X-ray by, uh, binary stellar systems, accretion disks in binary or accretion disks in uh, AGN. So whenever the matter is transferred uh, from a companion to a compact object or uh, from a surrounding to any black hole, because the matter will have a finite angular momentum, it cannot directly fall into it. And in that process, it must pass through a phase, which is accretion disk. And then when it is coming close to the compact object, it must lose energy, uh, which is sort of essentially conversion of a gravitational potential energy of the compact object. And then that is, uh, uh, again, I mean, uh, you know that that is the most efficient uh, process to convert a kind of a mass into energy in, uh, in universe. So uh, this accretion process, accretion energy is the kind of driver for the entire X-ray luminosity, which we see uh, today. Uh, Another important point which we need to uh, keep in mind while discussing this particularly accretion process, accretion disks, is that uh, these are sort of intrinsically variable uh, objects. I mean, uh, uh, you would have uh, heard about uh, transient sources. I mean, uh, uh, low mass X-ray binaries or high mass X-ray binaries, which typically undergo outbursts every few years, every uh, uh, days or few years. Or sometimes you might have heard about the uh, sources which are variable over a very short time scale of few seconds or few uh, minutes or hours. So that is essentially coming because of the variability within, in the accretion uh, uh, process. So uh, you have to keep in mind that X-ray sky is intrinsically variable, which is a kind of, if you are coming from uh, optical uh, astronomy, then uh, variability of any source is sort of quite uh, of particular interest. Normally, we are used to say that, okay, once you know the magnitude of a particular star, it is not likely to change anytime soon. But uh, that kind of a stable sources are very rare, in fact, uh, and, and they are almost very always sought after because those kind of sources we can actually use for comparing with different uh, uh, instruments. Because most of the time, what, what is going to happen is that when we observe one source, you measure some uh, X-rays. If you go next time, you will end up measuring a different intensity. And then quite often it is because of the source itself is varying. But then it is also possible that there are the differences in instruments. So then uh, uh, decoupling this is sort of very tricky. And then that is where uh, the so, uh, what we call uh, stable sources are very important. Uh, but most of the time, the other uh, so uh, essentially which we want to address is the variability of the X-ray uh, sources. So then again, I mean, this is just, I'm, I'm showing only these all pretty pictures. You would have seen all of them, but you know that these are artist impressions. 
we don't see anything like this i am sure you must have seen what we actually see is this so uh, uh, this is what when i was saying when we are uh, how would we actually interpret the physics behind the x ray sources so that is where this will come so uh, this panel if you see uh, i am just showing this uh, spectrum wide band spectrum of a black hole binary where you see uh, the data points i i hope you can see the data points at the higher energies there are more data points lower energy the data points are there but the errors are smaller so you see only as a line but essentially there is a, there is the model which is overplotted on data so total model is the solid black line but then it is decomposed by means of a spectral fitting into underlying different uh, components so you can see this is uh, the contribution from accretion disk then this is the contribution from a, a corona which uh, is expected to be surrounding uh, accretion disk now again uh, what is the shape shape and size of corona is a very important question but then there are various uh, theoretical models which will uh, predict that if the let us say corona is a spherical in size it would it would predict certain shape here if the corona is a cylindrical in size or sandwich type then it, there would be a slightly different shape here so by decomposing the overall uh, extra emission which we have measured in terms of this different component we can actually infer the geometry and the processes uh, which are going uh, close to this uh, x ray sources uh, uh, similarly there is this uh, reflection uh, process so this kind of components then they give a very uh, uh, good handle on the geometry of the sort of inner accretion region uh, similarly here uh, this panel shows the short term variability you can see the x axis is of the order of only few seconds 1000 seconds and then uh, again this is happening because of the instabilities in the inner accretion region so if you model this then you can understand what are the why it is happening uh, this panel is actually sort of even a finer time variability if you go sub second variability then instead of seeing it directly through this kind of light curves it is more uh, uh, sort of it is easier to go into frequency domain take a fourier transform of the light curve and then try to decompose the fourier transform under in various compo uh, components and then try to interpret how that variability would be arising from the source so uh, basically when we do x ray astronomy from uh, uh, observational side interpretation side basically we measure the x rays and then try to uh, interpret it in terms of the basic processes uh, in all these cases okay uh, this panel i am showing here this is x ray image this is actually a, a real x ray image of a crab nebula but uh, we have to keep in mind that uh, the images in x rays are relatively rare because most of the time the sources which we are observing are uh, uh, compact and essentially point sources we don't really uh, resolve them except uh, this kind of supernova remnants where uh, you have extended uh, uh, em emission from an extended region so uh, imaging is is a sort of uh, lim a limited to uh, this type of uh, extended sources but for most of the time uh, what we are, uh, need is uh, what we are looking for are the point sources so again i mean how is it done so i i, I sort of uh, uh, discuss this i mentioned already that essentially what uh, we have to uh, do is that we basically detect x ray photons coming from different astrophysical sources now again as i mentioned earlier for we are dealing with individual x ray photons so now each photon as and when it is detected i mean we can have sort of four basic attributes for each photon one is the time at which we detect which is one one quality one quantity then the other one is the energy of the incoming photon what energy it had and then theta phi are actually okay we can say a, a direction these are the direction from which it is coming so uh, now once you have measured this basically what we are doing is okay we try to histogram i mean uh, there are these three uh, three different ways in which you can uh, slice this data either you histogram it in a time uh, which will give you light curves and which based on which you can do all the timing studies as i showed in this panel here so this is the sort of uh, direct light curve or then you can take a fourier transform it and then uh, do this uh, if you histogram it in a energy intensity versus energy is what you call a spectrum and then you model the spectrum in terms of basic components and do spectroscopy you try to infer physics at the sources and imaging as a, as i mentioned so imaging uh, when you say theta phi it is like uh, arrival direction on uh, in space 
but uh, in in actual instrument then you would be actually doing in a 2d xy coordinates so uh, when you do imaging you uh, do histogram in xy and then you do imaging studies you can do much more complex studies by combining them either uh, i mean uh, uh, timing in a given energy range or uh, a frequency uh, uh, sort of uh, spectroscopy or over a certain time resolved period or maybe if there are some pulsation if there are uh, any uh, then you can do some phase resolved uh, analysis so there are various complex techniques are possible but fundamentally these are the three ways which we are uh, doing uh, that what you call data analysis in x ray astronomy and as i said again you investigate various feature whatever you observe and try to interpret them in terms of basic emission processes so uh, but also uh, we have to understand i mean uh, it's not always possible or it may not it may happen that you don't have always all these attributes i mean that is that is some, um, that is basically because of the limitations for example if you have a, a sort of a very simple uh, detector which does not have uh, resolve or uh, either, either in terms of energy or position it only measures say like arrival of the photon then basically what you have is only uh, timing of time of the arrival arrival time but uh, if you have a detector which can measure up to certain level extent energy but it does not have any intrinsic position resolution that means it does not know within the detector active volume where the interaction happened then you will not get a position of it so uh, these are so and uh, various detector limitations which you need to sort of take into account when uh, we are uh, using those detectors anyway i mean as a end user we, we don't have to uh, we don't have any choice because these are coming from uh, while you are designing instrument to make a new observation when you are using data from various instruments these are already done and you are getting the data according to uh, those choices but while using the data you have to keep that in mind because quite often what happens is that uh, uh, sometimes it is not always possible to uh, get for example if you have a, a detector which has a, a relatively uh, poor energy resolution but then if you are trying to uh, uh, sort of uh, get energy spectrum from it you might get a numbers but then those might actually be not much meaningful so you need to understand these limitations and then uh, analyze the data accordingly that is what is sort of important uh, i am just making a passing remark here uh, about uh, additional uh, uh, attributes that is what to call polarization angle and the polarization fraction uh, I'm not going to discuss any of this thing further in this talk because X-ray polarimetry is again a completely uh, a different topic which we need to discuss uh, once you have some basic idea in terms of uh, 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 X-ray astronomy. So uh, again, first it's, it's also completely unexplored field, but then since I'm not touching upon that, we will not go into more detail of X-ray polarimetry. I mentioned here because uh, it, it comes uh, as a part of again uh, some remarks in my later slides so that is why just for the completeness i have mentioned here that x-ray polarimetry is a very important and developing field uh, but maybe okay uh, right now we will not be discussing or oh, sometime later i think you might uh, come across this discussion further so okay so now once we know how it is done where so what is important to understand is that we are not actually getting x-rays directly from any sources at earth because uh, earth's atmosphere actually blocks all the so x-rays coming from outside atmosphere which is good in some sense because uh, we are not exposed to uh, radiation out outside radiation but then if you want to study the sources in x-rays then of course you have to go beyond the atmosphere so uh, then it has to be done either uh, on any of uh, these platforms i mean you can either use a rocket is you can send instruments on the rocket you can send instruments on satellites or you can send instruments on balloon let us say at higher energy because here i'm showing this plot of the atmospheric transmission as you see uh, in, in higher energy x-rays the, uh, they can actually penetrate down to a uh, certain uh, depth in atmosphere which is typically around 40 50 kilometer and balloons do fly up to 40 kilometers so if you have uh, some instrument on balloon you will be able to detect x-rays beyond certain energy so uh, that and and that is how i will show in next slide i mean that that played a very important role in the initial uh, days of the x-ray astronomy but later part i mean the basic progress of the field is very closely linked with the space technology as you can understand because essentially all x-ray observations are done in space 
but that also means that these are extremely challenging observation i mean because uh, uh, it's like in, in optical uh, let us say you see uh, there are many more telescopes many more observatories in fact you can set up a small telescope in very small colleges universities etc uh, that kind of observations are not possible here because you uh, because of the requirement of going to space so that inevitably going to space means it's a very high cost but the other important point is reliability that means whatever instrument you have designed or whatever detector you have made uh, has to work perfectly first time because uh, there is no way you can go and uh, change it or repair it i mean so if, if, if in, in a ground based instrument i mean it's, it's a kind of advantage again there it might cost in terms of additional time etc but at least you have opportunity to go and uh, repair something but in, in space most of the time i mean almost every uh, always is that kind of possibility is not there and the other point again i mean size weight because you are going on uh, going to space on satellite i mean you cannot have arbitrarily large uh, detectors or uh, optics or telescopes etc so all these are the uh, sort of challenges of actually conducting x ray observations and then as a result uh, there are relatively fewer experiments and but in this context the last point which is very important that because there are fewer experiments and then there is a tradition that almost all the data which is observed it, it becomes available publicly at some point of time typically maybe after one year or at the most two years so uh, when you are actually using data i mean when you want to look for data when you are getting started in the field uh, you are not bothered with all the challenges of designing instrument or sending it in space and all that was the case when in the early days of x-ray astronomy when anybody wanted to do x-ray observation they had to develop their build their own instrument they have to develop their own uh, balloon platforms or something and then send then only you can do that nowadays that is uh, not the case i mean so uh, in that sense conduct uh, doing x-ray astronomy is a relatively uh, straightforward in fact all you need is a basic simple uh, computer normal computer and your uh, internet connection and then the data is available all the publications all the literature is available you can start doing so uh, this public data archive us are playing a very important role in sort of uh, advancing this field and sort of nurturing the community so now i mean if you had been listening little carefully then uh, there is a natural question would come uh, uh, arises that if we know that x rays don't come to earth and uh, uh, then how it started i mean how the first observation were carried out i mean that's a natural question because uh, there is no way to know that the x rays also can come from astrophysical sources so i mean it's it's a sort of interesting uh, little bit of history to understand uh how it started is basically uh, from observations of sun i mean uh, okay again here you might be aware uh, that sun is a normal star its temperature is only five, uh, around 6000 degree kelvin you can measure the temperature of sun using optical spectrum that is what when you are measuring spectra uh, temperature that is of the photosphere now specifically during the eclipse time when the entire sun is sort of blocked you do see this kind of atmosphere of sun which is you know solar corona and these uh, solar corona observations were there they have been going on for many e years maybe more than a century i they started maybe in the middle of uh, 18th century kind of a modern temperature uh, observations of uh, solar corona and then uh, people start, had observed some uh, very sort of uh, intriguing lines uh, which were not known from any other normal element because by uh, in a late 18th 19th century early 20th century the spectroscopic techniques were advanced uh, reasonably so that uh, all the normal uh, characteristic lines were known but then many lines were observed in corona which were not identified with any specific elements which are there in uh, uh, earth's at a like terrestrial uh, situation in fact helium which is the most abundant uh, element that itself was first sort of known in uh, corona but in in this case like uh, uh, when they were identified it was i think around uh, late 1940s uh, these lines were identified as uh, characteristic lines coming from highly ionized ions so for typically like uh, iron green line or iron uh, red line which people uh, discuss they are supposed to be iron 14 or iron uh, 13 emission 
so that means 13 electrons of, uh, of uh, iron has been taken off and that is possible only if the temperature is extremely high so which means the corona must be extremely hot certainly more than 1 million kelvin but then if this thin gas is there above 1 million kelvin then it also must be emitting x rays so this was the basic premise for which people wanted to uh, uh, confirm and then uh, sort of uh, in late 1940s i mean when the world war ended you know world war there were lot of rockets missiles and rockets are essentially same thing so then there were a lot of rockets available and then people started to make use started to use them in a more productive way they put a x ray detectors on it and then the x rays from sun were confirmed in uh, late 1940s around 1949 1950 so this, this is how you actually initially first see that why you need to go to space to actually observe that uh, to uh, x rays from any uh, any source particularly from sun but now once sun solar x rays are confirmed then again then the natural question would be ki like uh, if the x rays are there so uh, the uh, for the rest of the experiments the uh, thought process was that if the solar x rays when they interact with moon then moon also in turn would generate some x rays by x ray fluorescence and then we should be able to detect x rays from moon also so uh, in order to detect solar x rays you need a very very small detector you don't need a very uh, big detector and very easily you can detect because the uh, even though luminosity of sun in x ray is very small compared to optical luminosity since it's very close the total flux observed is much higher but that same detector will not be able to detect x rays from moon because of the solar x rays because you require much larger detector so then uh, this uh, jiconi at all uh, bruno rossi and uh, jiconi they designed this detector which can which according to their uh, expectation could have been uh, or should be it could detect x rays from moon of course i mean it, it, it did not really detect but then this was a completely chance detection of a very strong x ray source co x1 so this i mean so basically when it started nobody knew that there are this kind of x ray sources would be possible in 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 the uh, universe because if you simply compare the uh, x ray luminosity of sun and uh, extrapolate it to other stars it was natural that uh, stars would not have i mean x rays from a different stars could not be directly detectable uh, from earth so basically this chance discovery was what was the birth of x ray astronomy and uh, many of you might be aware that this ricardo jiconi actually got a nobel prize for uh, this discovery in 2012 so this was a sort of completely uh, new path breaking discovery and it started the whole field of uh, x ray astronomy uh, after that again i mean then the many uh, once you know that there are extra sources apart from sun then there were many other rocket uh, flights during uh, that decade but rocket flights have their own limitation you can uh, understand because typically rocket flights last only for few minutes and within that few a span of few minutes we have to do some observations which is quite uh, cumbersome so then people were looking for other possibilities which was like balloon born observation so as i mentioned i mean uh, hard x rays do come down Uh, to up to 40 km which is accessible by balloon and then balloon would light uh, balloon typical balloon flights last for few hours so then there were large number of balloon observation observations in late 1960s early 1970s and and then that sort of solid uh, uh, actually uh, made uh, i mean uh, good progress was made using this uh, balloon flights uh, also it is interesting to note that at that particular time uh, there was a very strong participation in the balloon program from india uh, particularly tifr group which was having uh, this balloon flights in early early 1970s and many significant discoveries were made um, uh, by that and then even so internationally competitive internationally renowned balloon program was there during that time so history of x ray astronomy in india is also almost uh, of a similar uh, time and it started from uh, that and uh, that is how it has sort of culminated later uh, into a satellite program so we will discuss a little bit later on that uh, balloon born i mean once you go on a satellite based observation then of course you would think that balloon born observations are of not uh, great use because anyway there are limited in terms of few only few hour flights uh, 
but they are still important today. I mean, there are a lot of groups, including uh, there is our own balloon facility at Hyderabad TFR facility. There is very active. A lot of groups are uh, conducting the balloon flights regularly. And uh, nowadays, the most important advantage of this is uh, uh, because they provide a sort of a quick taste for a new technology. So if you have some new type of detector, if you have some new type of concept which you want to prove, then uh, balloon flights are much cheaper and much easier to uh, taste this concept. So and in that way, uh, context, there are many groups worldwide are working and then even uh, our own balloon facility is very active in that. But once this balloon era sort of for mainstream extra observation ended in 1970 uh, with basically a satellite launch uh, in 1970 that is a dedicated satellite for X-ray astronomy it's called Uhuru. So this was the uh, basically a survey satellite. It, it, it was meant to look at the entire sky. Uh, it lasted for I, I think two, three years. And then uh, during that, it, it, it surveyed the entire sky and detected total 39 X-ray sources. This is just show a quick uh, map of the, all the X-ray sources detected by uh, Uhuru. Uh, you can see it is the most of the sources are sort of concentrated to in the galactic plane. So obviously, they are all uh, galactic sources. But there are some sources which are off galactic plane and then so it is also likely that the, I mean, people thought that not all the X-ray sources are only concentrated in uh, galactic uh, plane. So there must be some extra galactic sources also. So this was the state at, uh, at, at that point when uh, uh, X-ray astronomy was just beginning. Now it is almost 60 years and then it is like a, a, a enormous amount of progress. So if you see sensitivity wise, uh, I mean, when we uh, from this state where we are counting actually a few tens or maybe hundreds of sources, whereas if you see normal stars, I mean, there are billions of stars uh, uh, literally. So, uh, but now if you go in terms of sensitivity, particularly in soft X ray, it's almost comparable. And uh, we have a, a huge amount of uh, information for various uh, sources available. But again, here I have made this qualifier that is a soft X ray. So uh, soft X-ray means, as I mentioned earlier, below 10 keV. Hard X-ray that is above 10 keV is still lagging behind. Why? Uh, we will uh, see a little uh, later if we can uh, discuss. Uh, but so uh, improving uh, further this thing, hard X-ray is still important. But in general, X-ray sources, when we are talking X-ray astronomy, uh, in terms of uh, counterparts of various uh, sources, for uh, optical versus X-ray, we have uh, a sort of very good uh, progress, particularly because of the what we call focusing telescopes, which I will discuss a little later. So uh, as I said, I mean, so this is a sort of satellite era. Uh, I am just showing these are uh, uh, pictures for different satellites. I'm, I'm showing it here. I'm going to show the same pictures later on again. Uh, but so uh, after discussing some uh, basics of the detectors and uh, optics. So at that time, this will make a slightly uh, better uh, sense of how to compare or uh, sort of what are the merits, the merits of individual uh, uh, observatories and why there are so many different types of observatories and how they are helping to understand uh, various sectors for this further. So, now, so I mean, so before uh, uh, moving on, so now I will just move to like uh, the uh, some basics of actual X-ray detection in detectors. How do they work? So uh, I am sh most likely, I think you would have heard about uh, uh, various uh, gas field detectors as a part of your uh, master's course. Typically, uh, geiger muller counter and ion chambers, etc., are being sort of taught. So. Uh, Traditional X-ray detectors comprise of essentially the gas field detector, which is, but they are used in a proportional regime. So proportional regime means it's essentially a, 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 a gas chamber where an incident photon interact with the gas generates electron ion pair. Because of the peculiar electric field close to a very sort of thin anode, you do get a, a electron cascade, you get amplification. But the amplification is such that the eventual uh, charge which is collected on anode is still proportional to the incident photon charge. So in this regime, it is uh, it's called a proportional counter. So uh, uh, if you know, there are this Geiger diagram where uh, at, at a different high voltage, I mean, uh, different high voltage applied on anode, 
if it is at a lower uh, uh, voltage then it will be go it will work in a sort of ion chamber mode if it is very high voltage then it will go in a geiger mode where a, even a single interaction would completely discharge the tube in a proportional mode is in in, uh, in between where the you can still uh, measure the total charge which would be proportional to incident photon energy so by this way you can actually measure the energy of the incoming photon but of course because of this uh, uh, amplification is involved which is essentially a statistic process a statistical process uh, the accuracy by which you can actually measure the incident and uh, charge you know, uh, incident photon energy is a uh, relatively poor so uh, as i said i mean you can see uh, this delta e by e which is what is called resolution is around 20% for this kind of detector so if at at 6 kv again this is a function of energy so if it is slightly higher energy photon is there then this number will be slightly uh, less but uh, typically so when you are comparing detectors you also have uh, a, a energy resolution of detector then you also need to know at what energy the resolution is specified uh the other uh, traditional detector was a scintillator which was actually used for a slightly higher energy x rays particularly beyond 20 kv so these scintillators are the material when uh, any incident radiation x ray or maybe even a charged particle in, interact with that it, it it will generate an optical light or typical normal optical photon which can then be actually detected by uh, any optical uh, sensor in this case mostly what is used is a micro channel uh, this uh, photomultiplier tube so in here there are these two different stages of amplification one is the first conversion of energy incident photon energy into optical photon itself is a statistical process and then the subsequent uh, uh, amplification of the charge by uh, various diodes is also a similar process so then as a result here the resolution is much poor compared to even uh, proportional counter but then there are no other ways to detect it so then you have to live with that kind of resolution so at harder ex uh, high, high energy x-rays you, you do get uh, at this level of resolution that is at uh, around so if you see the number here the 15 percent is lower compared to a proportional counter but in terms of absolute uh, width it would be of course more uh, then the newer generation, uh, there are these detectors which are called semiconductor detectors. Again, I'm, I'm sure you must be aware about what is semiconductor. These are the various uh, material with a relatively narrow band gap energy between insulator and the conductors. So now in this case, suppose if you deposit a small, uh, if, you, if you provide enough energy to uh, the active volume, uh, you will generate one electron hole pair and then if you apply a potential across the anode and cathode you can collect the electron hole pair and then again uh, do the similar analysis so uh, because of the low band gap energy for a same given energy of uh, photon uh, you have more number of electron hole pairs compared to let us say what you had electron ion in uh, ion uh, proportional counter so as a result you have a higher energy resolution for semiconductor detectors but then also uh, because the band gap is smaller you uh, number of quite often it happens that you do get a thermally excited electron hole pairs also so this is uh, sort of uh, it, it it generates a uh, noise floor what you call so uh, i'm just sort of showing this table here there are the three typical uh, just semiconductor semiconductor materials which are used for x-ray detectors silicon uh, germanium and this czt or cadmium zinc telluride or cadmium telluride this is a slightly uh, newer uh, uh, material. So in silicon, you see band gap is around 1, 1.1 EV. Germanium, it's uh, lower 0.7. CZT comparatively uh, higher. So as a result, the CZT can be operated at a near room temperature, whereas for silicon and germanium, it is it's sort of uh, necessary to operate them at a slightly cooler temperature. Germanium actually quite low, uh, minus 70 degree. And then germanium actually can be operated in a larger volume. So as a result here actually a uh, 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 more elaborate cryogenic uh, uh, techniques needs to employ for op operating germanium whereas silicon can be operated by a more traditional like passive cooling or uh, thermoelectric cooling kind of uh, arrangements in space again what you have to understand is that this kind of temperature which we are looking for in space or on satellite platform so that is why it is it's, it's sort of difficult to uh, realize them so uh, again, I uh, already mentioned uh, energy resolution. Uh, so I will just quickly uh, go through because uh, because of uh, there is this intrinsic statistical process. Even though incident uh, energy 
incident beam is a monoenergetic uh, beam you will always see some spread here and then uh, that spread will have combination of both the intrinsic as well as the if there any noise in terms of basic front end electronics so it will also it is also added in quadrature so typically all efforts in the while designing the basic detector and electronics are such that you uh, uh, add as low as noise possible uh, these are some of the uh, various configuration silicon is as you know is a very very widely used uh, uh, element in semiconductor uh, industry and then uh, because of that we can use it in a various different configuration again i will not go into merits and demerits of all various these things but uh, uh, i am just showing this silicon drift detector which is a kind of a new uh, advanced version of it i i am just briefly mentioning in the upcoming one of uh, sdd for one of the upcoming missions so i am just showing here but uh, the basic idea here is that uh, uh, a, a silicon drift detector actually can uh, uh, combines sort of most of the good features which are required in xr detector that is you can actually get a high resolution you can get a individual event mode uh, readout as well as uh, you can uh, operate it at a nor uh, normal temperatures but the other mainstream detector which is everywhere used is uh, 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 is x ray ccd so these are sort of again same almost same as normal ccds and uh, if you are familiar then uh, ccds are actually uh, kind of a frame based readout again so i i just go back here when i showed here like uh, there is one silicon entire volume if it is read in a one uh, by a one anode then you will have only one readout if you split anode in multiple uh, uh, strips or pixels then you will have your number of readouts will increase accordingly either 2n or n square ccds have large number of pixels very small pixels but still uh, their readout is planned such that finally you can uh, have only one readout so how it is done is that essentially you transfer the charge uh, you collect the charge in each pixel for certain time what you call exposure time and after that you transfer the charge across the all the rows come down and then finally you transfer the charge in this row to electronics unit so this is how it it's shown in the sort of analogy of the conveyor belt so finally you have only one readout channel which you can optimize it fully you can do it very nicely so that you have very high resolution but then this requires long time to read it out so essentially this is called a frame burst so you 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 expose the entire frame for certain duration and then after that you read out uh, that frame so in in this process what happens is that uh, you cannot measure the time of the individual photon interaction at a time scale lower than the your frame readout time and in 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 ccds typically it is of the order of seconds or maybe sometime uh, even up to 4 5 seconds or in uh, many cases even if it is fraction of second but ideally what you want to know is that time is with the uh, at a much higher time uh, accuracy which is not possible in ccd so when uh, um, you uh, do this so once you have the collected charge then basically what you are getting is you are digitizing it what you call analog to digital conversion adc so finally what you have from each data extra detector is essentially one adc channel corresponding to photon energy and the interaction time if you have now a sort of pixelated detector or a ccd type of detector then you will have this two coordinates xy uh, position so and then as we earlier mentioned that basic data will consist of the list of these uh, events now again uh, since we know that the uh, detector cannot measure a monoenergetic line as a single monoenergetic line uh, there will always be spread the concept of this response of a detector response is important because you know that uh, even if there is a same energy photon is coming next time it may not have exactly same adc channel as it was in the previous event but there are some other processes for uh, uh, like for example if there is only statistical process then it would give a, a line only a, with a normal gaussian shape the width of the gaussian might increase or decrease depending on the resolution but there are additional complications like sometimes sometimes you don't collect the entire chart sometimes you have some what you call escape peaks that means even though the photon has interacted a part of it has been escaped by fluorescence uh, uh, process so this kind of uh, uh, processes give uh, what you call a uh, peculiar detector response for example if you see uh, uh, this is that these top two panels correspond to a, a response of a proportional counter where 
you see if you have a 20 kv incident photon mostly you will get a nice gaussian shape but then they will get a, you will have a long tail but if the uh, photon energy is higher than sort of a, a kh energy I, I assume you are familiar with uh, this uh, then you will get uh, uh, this characteristic line emission fluorescent line emission so then even if the, there is no incident photons for uh, uh, lower energies you will actually see this peak for 40 kv photon uh, in case of czt again you start getting this slightly stronger line uh, this is a, a response for a silicon detector which is as you can see relatively cleaner but still it, it, it does have some features at a lower energy so what is important is like i mean you need to have a very accurate understanding of all the detector response when you want to actually may, uh, interpret the data because uh, finally our objective is to interpret the spectrum in terms of the incident uh, of photon uh, spectrum but what we are measuring is what is detected so now suppose uh, if we measure a fo x-ray photon from a, some source and we see this line but these are not present at that particular uh, source then uh, and, and we try to interpret this then we end up doing a wrong interpretation so that is why the very uh, uh, accurate understanding of the detector response is a very important for uh, sort of uh, correct interpretation and then this is what process is called calibration so the uh, the uh, the entire x-ray astronomy essentially is relying on a good calibration of our instruments okay i think i'm being late here so i will try to move a little fast now uh, so uh, Again, uh, from X-rays, I mean, typically, we, as I mentioned earlier, you for a given energy also you will get a much lower amount of photons. So normally, X-rays of uh, uh, from astrophysical uh, sources you have only very limited photons. Like these are some of the brightest sources. The crab, which I thought it's a sort of a standard source which is not variable. Uh, if you consider around two to ten kV energy range, uh, you get only five photons per second per centimeter square if you measure. Or let us say this coax one, which is a, a brightest source in the sky, it will only give 20 photons. Now uh, this is completely uh, uh, different from an optical uh, astronomy where you have much larger signals. So, uh, but again, in terms of analysis, we anyway require more number of photons. So there are either you keep on observing it for a long time, or then the only, uh, but then you have to compromise your timing or variability studies. So the only other object uh, possibility is to collect it over a much larger area. Now, in X-rays, I mean, you uh, typically in optical uh, uh, astronomy, what is done is like you put a telescope. The collecting area of a telescope is the area of a mirror, but the detector is a very small. And then you focus the entire uh, all the light collected over the entire mirror area on a small detector, which, and then you get a nice, very good signal to noise ratio, and you get a good sensitivity. This is not possible for X-ray because X-rays cannot be reflected at large angle. So then what you have to do is only like you have to limit the field of view by means of collimator and then you try to make as large detector as possible. But then again, there are issues like, for example, uh, the as I mentioned, each detector will have its own background and the background typically uh, goes as the size and uh, volume of the detector. So sensitivity of a detector will not improve greatly even if you increase much larger area. But this type of configuration why where it is useful is if you have the sources which are already bright enough, for example, they are above background, like all uh, the kind of this example which I gave or the other bright X-ray uh, black hole binaries where you can easily detect them. For detailed studies of those, uh, this kind of large area collimated detectors are very important. And uh, so uh, all earlier detectors were like uh, this kind of collimated detectors, like as I mentioned, Uhuru itself, and then later on it started uh, Exocet or Ginga. Uh, around so you can see how the effective area actually collecting area evolved over time the most important of this kind of large area detect uh, collimator detector is rxt pca it was launched in 1996 and it, it functioned till i think 9, 2012 so 15 16 years and it was a sort of the uh, 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 most important uh, x-ray astronomy satellite and a lot of people including myself i mean i i have my own uh, uh, phd is based on the data from RXT PCA. So it, it, it has helped a vast generation of, uh, I mean, entire generation of people to uh, do good studies in X-ray astronomy. So, uh, and, but now this is sort of um, no more available. So uh, 
as of now we don't have any other uh, uh, detector okay i mean i will come to it astrocyte like species the only other observation i will come to that little later but uh, the basic this concept of having a large area collimator detector i mean rxt proved it is such a in such a nice way that there are uh, uh, various other proposals where people are trying to go now again uh, this is for a much larger i mean so uh, since uh, uh, rxt pca was only about 6000 square centimeter that is less than a 1 meter square uh, originally people started uh, uh, conce conceiving this kind of uh, me, uh, detectors and missions with a much larger almost 10 times larger area uh, this was loft large observatory for x ray timing it was proposed but somehow it was not accepted but the same has been uh, reconfigured as uh, another mission called the uh, enhanced extra timing uh, and polarimetry mission which is a mission by china and it's likely to be launched in 2027 so but with a slightly reduced uh, collecting area so basically uh, the detectors which are collimated but a large area are are very important and they have very very a key role in advancing the field even though sort of they cannot uh, go for the faintest uh, sources but in order to detect these kind of faint sources then what is required is only the x-ray focusing uh, now as i mentioned earlier x-rays cannot be reflected at a large angle but if the incidence angle is uh, below a particular angle which depends on the energy of the photon it's called critical angle and the other requirement uh, the surface is extremely smooth now smooth means this smoothness needs to be of the order of the wavelength which we are interested in so like for example if we are uh, uh, reflecting a, a x-ray with a one angstrom uh, wavelength then the surface smoothness needs to be of the order of one angstrom so this is extremely difficult uh, to achieve but still it can be done i mean it, it, there are various techniques available by which you can actually realize that kind of surfaces so uh, then you can uh, uh, have this kind of x-ray mirror uh, so then it would be possible to sort of design a conceive a kind of a grazing incidence telescope for soft x-ray i mean again why soft x-ray is because about 10 kv then the critical angle becomes much smaller and then these kind of designs are sort of getting impractical and uh, then uh, this hans walter he actually was uh, studying this uh, sort of uh, theoretically all the configuration he actually showed uh, uh in the context of uh, various other extra applications for various synchrotron beams and all that uh, it would be possible uh, it would require at least two reflections i mean one from paraboloid other from or, or another from hyperboloid or uh, ellipsoid surface in order to have a practical extra telescope by practical extra telescope means uh, it, it's a free of particularly cometic aberration uh, uh, if you have only single reflection then what would happen is that for on axis x rays it would focus properly but as you go little away from on axis it would focus completely different place so then uh, that kind of telescope would not be actually very useful so then walter sort of came up with this three different configuration but for astronomical purposes essentially what is used is this walter type 1 telescope so now if we see grazing incidence if you use a single mirror which is a sort of a, a kind of a cylindrical shell uh, its effect total area would be very small so a standard practice is to use a multiple of them so it's called an nested mirror design where if you see it from front side you will see this kind of rings so again i mean the total effective area is much smaller compared to the sort of geometric area of the aperture but still i mean that is what at the best we can do so as i said i mean uh, the first extra telescope which actually uh, was uh, launched way back in 1978 was this kind of Walter one uh, uh, mirror and then after that there have been number of X-ray telescopes which are launched one key sort of I would say not innovation but a, a clever way to do it is what we call conical approximation strictly speaking these foils are again parabola and hyperbola but then the curvature is extremely small so in principle you can actually uh, uh, consider them as a conical surfaces so if you do that then it might be possible to realize these uh, uh, foils or these mirrors in a much thinner uh, substrates and then as a result you can pack a large number of shells so this is what is the approximation which is done traditionally in uh, many different uh, telescopes so i will just show this now again i will come back here for this comparison so this is a chandra x observatory i'm sure you must have heard and this is xmm newton so uh, the key difference between them is like uh, this Chandra is like it's a true Walter one design so you can see uh, there are these only four shells 
but each shell is very precisely polished and figured to a required parabolic and hyperbolic as a hyperbolic surface as a result uh, you had much higher uh, much better imaging performance compared to xmm but then the xmm Newton the advantage would be that you are packing a much larger number of foils <coughs> so your total effective area will be very high so uh, what you get is i mean uh, ultimate objective is to collect large number of photons from a, a given source so for that the xmm newton is also doing a very good job so uh, <coughs> depending on the sort of objective which we are looking for you can see in which way uh, you have to decide uh, uh, which one to uh, a telescope to be used for the observation for example if you are interested in uh, very fine imaging or detecting very faint source then chandra is the of, of course observatory of choice <coughs> sorry but uh, if you are sort of looking for a known bright source then xmm newton would provide a better uh, signal because it, it has much larger area uh, so just quickly again i am sort of out of my time actually but so quickly go through uh, i mentioned that focusing is possible only up to 10 kev uh, because uh, below above 10 kev the critical angle is uh, very small and you uh, you get sort of much impractically larger uh, focal length one way to change here is that you can enhance reflectivity by what you call uh, a multi-layer coating. Now, these coatings con uh, consist of actually uh, uh, different uh, material, uh, alternate uh, layers of low and high Z elements, like typically, let's say, tungsten and silicon or platinum and carbon and that type of the material. The uh, requirement here is that the thickness should be of the order in which we are looking for the X-ray reflectivity. So it should be like of the order of a few nanometer or maybe few tens of angstrom. So if we can make a large number of these errors, then since this reflected, uh, all these uh, reflected rays would interfere constructively and finally you will get a, a appreciable reflectivity even at an angle above the critical angle. So that is the basic concept. And But then if you have the same thickness of each layer, then it would work only for a particular energy because it works on the principle of Bragg reflectivity. But then what you can do, another clever uh, technique apply here is uh, to change the thickness over the uh, coating. So you call them a great depth graded coating where you can have a broadband response. So this is the kind of uh, idea which people apply for hard X-ray focusing. Uh, so far, it has been done only for one uh, X-ray telescope, uh, which is a new star by NASA. It is already launched. I think maybe some of you are uh, familiar with that. So, uh, but I mean, okay, there was another uh, hard X-ray telescope launched on board Japanese satellite, but unfortunately, it could not work uh, more. But if we want to enhance, let us say, sensitivity in hard X-ray, which I mentioned earlier, that at, at about 10 kV, the sensitivity is still relatively poor. The only way is to actually have a hard X-ray, true hard X-ray focusing telescope, uh, uh, which right now it, it's not present. I mean, right now it's only one telescope uh, working, and obviously we need a, a much uh, more such telescopes in order to uh, carry out all the required observations. So in that context, I mean, uh, I will just briefly flash a couple of slides on AstroSat. I think all of you are familiar, so I won't spend any time here. Uh, uh, but the main uh, point I, would, I just uh, wanted to convey is that if uh, you would have seen this kind of specification tables a number of times, but if you sort of, if you would have gone through some of the discussion which I had, like in terms of the area or in terms of resolution, then you will be able, you will be in a position to sort of compare it in a, a much uh, more uh, meaningful way. And then you can see that uh, this was a sort of a package of very nicely designed and conceived. The one thing is you have the Lex PC. Lex PC is a proportional counter, uh, uh, collimated proportional counter, which is a direct uh, sort of uh, uh, continuing the studies by uh, RXT. The, right, as of now, this is the only instrument which can do that kind of timing studies. And so uh, it and it, it has even larger effective area or similar effective area as uh, RXT. Along with that, it also has a soft X-ray image uh, focusing telescope. So even though the telescope is much smaller, but when you compare the sensitivity, it is almost same as what uh, or better than Lex PC. So now when you compare these two, you get a much uh, a broader band of spectroscopy with a still comparable sensitivity, which is what is more important. Normally what happens is if you if you do simultaneous observation with let's say Chandra and RXT PCA, then Chandra has a, such a high sensitivity that you cannot actually observe the same sources by the two. And then even if you observe, you, you are affected by different systematic errors, systematics. 
so in in that context uh, this was a very nicely conceived and designed package and uh, as you all uh, know i mean okay i am not going to discuss more about uh, cctti and ssm uh, maybe sometime if you have if you would have heard the specific talk on astroset you can uh, you could have heard this or otherwise maybe in sometime in future you can uh, get more details but basic point here is that uh, astroset as i am saying uh, uh, it was a very uh, nice package of extra instrument also material instrument because of uh, presence of uit and uh, it has been sort of of course you know it's uh, operating very nicely it has a, a very successful more than 100 paper publications uh, now okay i mean this is a slightly uh, debatable uh, merit whether this is the only way to measure success or not and then there are people who including sort of also in that that in principle it could have been more than this but of course you have to understand that this was for the entire indian extra community this was a first time experiment where uh, such a complex uh, satellite multiple instruments were being designed realized and uh, calibrated tested and also from a community perspective perspective they were being used for the first time in the country so from that context it's certainly that our uh, uh, astro set is a very 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 successful uh, mission uh, lex pc as i said it's the only instrument right now which can continue the rxd legacy CZTI did not uh, uh, discuss anything, but it's it's a uh, it has such a highly uh, versatile instrument. Uh, it, it has become that it has opened up a new field of hard X-ray polarimetry, uh, and also it has turning out to be a very good GRB detector. There are uh, these. I think uh, some of this part uh, yesterday Varun Balara would have uh, discussed, I presume. Uh, so uh, and the most important key point is like as I said, Astrosat has uh, succeeded in generating a large user base. So. in order to continue this i mean so how we are planning what we are thinking i mean how to go beyond astrosat so the present thinking uh, uh, particularly i mean uh, from our side is uh, that we need to sort of identify the niche area which is there because there are a lot of groups worldwide uh, there are various missions which are being planned for example i i just gave example uh, that was the one extp but then focusing also there were uh, there are many other uh, missions which are being planned so what we need to do is we need to identify one specific niche area which what from the uh, with the discussion of a various sort of stakeholders within the community what we have identified is the broadband x-ray polarimetry is the field which is uh, which is going to be relevant or which is going to be important even after 10 years of the time when uh, we can launch this mission so this is right now proposed to isro uh, as a future uh, mission uh, beyond astrosat Uh, so this will have both soft and hard x-ray telescope as i said i mean the making x-ray telescope x-ray mirrors is ext extremely challenging but yes i mean we have taken up the challenge and hopefully we will be able to su uh, succeed in that uh, as i said no hard x-ray polarimeter in the world would be operational at that time as per the present plan so this is a very very uh, good opportunity to mark uh, to make a mark at international level and also in terms of the focal plane there are very innovative ideas but again we won't go into detail because that is getting more technical uh before that there is a possibility of another short term mission daksha i think uh, varun probably would have discuss about it i am not very sure but so uh, if this is on a slightly longer time scale maybe 8 to 10 year that uh, the daksha would be on a uh, would likely to fill a gap at around 5 to 6 year so uh, just to summarize i think i am already past some 10 15 minutes of my time so i will i will not spend too much time here essentially uh, 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 what i am saying is that okay we are likely to have a good time in our indian extra community not only from our only indian missions but also from international missions because as i said uh, uh, for doing extra astronomy it is not really necessary to get involved in actual instrument and develop actual instrument nowadays because observationally it is much easier what we require is a basically computer and internet connection which nowadays in india is available very very cheaply so uh, this actually provides a very good opportunity for any uh, uh, sort of non institute what we call i mean typically we know that in our uh, colleges or small universities and all their resources are little uh, sparse but even there also it would not be difficult to get uh, this kind of uh, internet and computer so anybody can start basically in um, uh, doing extra astronomy research what it requires is only you sort of get familiarized with the various instrument there are all documents available all literature uh, papers everything is available online uh, but 
so it is while it is never necessary to actually see the instrument or uh, work with the instrument it is still important to understand how it works because that then only you will be able to understand various calibration aspects and then uh, end up uh, sort of not interpreting over interpreting the data so i would still uh, stress that that even if you uh, never do any x ray real instrumentation uh, you should still be uh, aware of how the various instrument works and then finally as i said i mean the most relevant participation is the key uh, to sustain the momentum which has been generated by astrosat in which we are looking forward to sort of justify uh, the forthcoming missions which we are sort of proposing and planning so i will stop here i am out of time but still if there are any questions i would be happy thank you very much dr santosh um i see one question in the chat maybe i can read it out for you sure so ankit meena asks what is a major problem one major problem with studying x rays with normal telescopes in space normal uh, normal telescopes i mean what do you mean by normal telescopes you mean uh, so normal telescope means what i understand is like optical telescope which are normal incidence telescope is that what you mean sir this is optical telescope ah uh, so as i said i mean uh, x rays cannot be reflected at a large angle like optical uh, photons so x rays can get reflected only at a very narrow grazing angle incidence so that is why you have to design the telescopes which are operating in the grazing angle uh, regime the normal uh, normal incidence uh, optics will not uh, or does not work for uh, x ray in a traditional sense i mean for a very very low energy x ray less than 0.5 kv people do consider normal incidence with some multi layer coating and all but that is a very specific area in typical astro astronomical purpose a normal incidence telescopes are not uh, cannot be used Okay, sir. Okay, thank you. So there's a question from Ranjit Barla. Yeah. What is the histograms? Oh, okay. Uh, histogram. So uh, basically, when you have large number of uh, points, and when you want to sort of uh, see how many points fall particularly within the range of a, a certain parameter. for example a typical exercise which you do in uh, uh, your schools and colleges and marks like uh, if you are uh, uh, if you are having a discrete points and if you want to know how many are within uh, have a certain mark range then you are basically what you are doing is histogramming so that histogram is that only you you dis you decide a particular bean size for a parameter of interest in this case let us say energy and you try to find out how many photons are falling within that particular energy range then you go for the next uh, bin size you see how many photons are there within that bin, uh, energy range so then uh, finally you end up plotting it that intensity that is number of photons versus energy or number of photons versus time that is what you call histogram uh is it okay there is one more question from yeah. chinmay shahi observation of x ray data from a galaxy is the stand alone confirmation of smbh is that right uh okay i mean so as i said i mean okay smbh agns are a broad multi wavelength uh, emitters so nowadays almost all sources are multi wavelength emitters so um each wavelength range gives a specific insight into one particular aspect of it so uh, i don't think it would be correct to say that it's a stand alone confirmation but it is one of the confirmation for example the stand alone confirmation uh, if you want to uh, very categorically say that there is a smbh supermassive black hole then uh, uh, what would be required is a kind of a dynamical mass uh, measurement which you must be familiar uh, uh, this year's uh, nobel prize which went for that where you would have seen the kind of movies where the stars are actually rotating around the center of mass and then that indirectly tells uh, you need must have a more than a million solar mass in that such a small volume which could be only a black hole so that is a, so a, a stand alone confirmation i would say it, it is from that but x rays 
are sort of a byproduct of the fact that there is a supermassive black hole, there is an accretion, there is a, a corona which is expected that it's supposed to be hot and then it would give. So when we want to understand the immediate surroundings of the supermassive black hole, the X-ray observations would be more important. The mass of the black hole in interpretation of X-ray observation comes as an input parameter. So you need to sort of assume some mass there. All right, are there any other questions? Okay. Um, Sirsha, has, you have your hand raised. Do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, thank you, sir, for the wonderful talk. And I have a pretty naive and simple question. Uh, you told that presently the X-ray polarimetry is sort of an uh, unexplored uh, field of research. So what kind of new information about the astrophysical objects or phenomena can be gained from uh, X-ray polarimetry if we are able to do it, let's say, in future? Oh, okay. So this is a very interesting question. And uh, actually, it's a question justifying the whole talk for itself. Because, uh, uh, I mean, you need to... Uh, see, because, you know, I said that X-ray polarimetry is unexplored, but there are, it's unexplored because of various technical reasons, but there are a large number of people worldwide, many groups, they are actually uh, going after it to come up with the viable X-ray polarimeters and then doing observations with that. The basic premises here is that the polarization means uh, the, uh, essentially, what you are target, uh, uh, addressing is the geometry of the source region, which is so compact that it cannot be directly inferred or observed from any other way. Uh, polarization, that is the uh, electric field vector direction. If you have any preferential direction, then that is a direct indicator of what is the kind of geometry, whether it's a, a geometry or whether it's a magnetic field geometry, uh, you, uh, that provides a direct handle on it. Uh, there are various sources. For example, if you are talking about uh, uh, pulsars, uh, then uh, that uh, directly gives what is the kind of mechanism which is supposed to uh, uh, you you are expect because there are a lot of degeneracies even after doing all the spectral analysis timing analysis there are a lot of degeneracies in the model that means more than one model is compatible with all the X-ray spectral signatures which you observe more than one model is compatible with all the timing signatures which you observe so at that you need to have some other independent parameters with which you can uh, 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 sort of uh, de uh, decipher the de degeneracy and that is where the polarization plays very important role. Uh, another very key part is for black hole bar observations where, I mean, it is it's, it's sort of a, a very uh, nice and independent way to probe what you call uh, black hole spins. Uh, again, this is a sort of a slightly more uh, technical uh, uh, point of how it would address. But, I mean, you can understand, I mean, uh, black hole spin is a very, very important from other independent um, aspect where uh, because you are directly addressing the sort of uh, predictions of general relativity in a very, very strong gravity regime. So uh, what we need to have is the independent confirmations of a spin and uh, measuring polarization from a black hole is another way to sort of estimate a spin. So from all these points, uh, having a polarization measurements for all classes of excess sources is very important. But as I said, since these are sort of first generation polarimeters which are being discussed now for actual space observation, because so far there has not been any dedicated polarimeter in space for X-ray sources. Uh, right now, essentially what is targeted is uh, only uh, bright X-ray sources, uh, galactic sources. The first polarimeter will actually is likely to fly later this year from NASA, that is uh, the call imaging X-ray polarimeter. And then once it starts giving data, I mean, uh, uh, after that, the field again would sort of progress. So, uh, as I said, what we are trying to uh, do is a hard X-ray polarization because even IXP uh, is also limited to only uh, 10 keV polarization below 10 keV. But essentially, what you need is for all proper uh, uh, interpretation, uh, time uh, energy dependent uh, polarization over the entire 1 to 100 keV band, and uh, you have, I mean variety of different uh, science cases of how you will be able to actually use this and uh, interpret the polarization in terms of 
प्लीज एक्सेप्ट द सोर्स ओके सर थैंक यू थैंक्स अ लॉट ओके इफ देयर आर नो अदर क्वेश्चंस आई डोंट आई डोंट सी एनी let us thank our speaker again thank you very much uh, dr santosh for for the wonderful talk thank you thank you very much so uh, i will uh, stop sharing yeah thanks a lot thanks a lot santosh ji okay how do i there must be a share button somewhere I... in your web oh stop okay yes yeah yeah okay thank you so, uh, thank you uh, maybe so now i uh, sort of i can uh, disconnect okay sure thanks a lot for joining thank you thank, thank you very much thank you very much okay uh moving on to our next talk by dr priyajit dr rajit hi okay. yes i am i'm here yes, hi 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 okay let me try to share the screen sure okay can you see my slides Uh, yes yes okay good all right shall i get started uh sure let me uh, may i just take a minute to introduce you sure so it's a pleasure to introduce dr p ajit from icts uh, bengaluru uh, dr ajit did his bsc in physics uh, sorry in physics uh, from the university of calicut in 2000 and msc in physics uh, with emphasis on astrophysics from mahatma gandhi university in 2003 and then he went on to complete his phd in physics uh, from the Ma max planck institute for gravitational physics and leibniz university of hanover in germany in 2007 uh, his research interests are uh, modeling of uh, broadly gravitational waves uh, so in in gravitational waves the modeling of gravitational wave sources gravitational wave data analysis and the interpretation of gravitational wave observations uh, dr rajit please go ahead okay thank you um i wanted to start by thanking the organizers for the this kind invitation i um, understand that this is the last day of your winter school and um chronologically speaking gravitational wave observations are the uh, a new tool set that we have in the astronomers arsenal so it is appropriate that we talk about gravitational wave astronomy at the end of this uh, this, this winter school So uh, let me uh, start by flashing um, a bunch of pictures which uh, which are obtained by um, astronomical observations of light in its different frequency bands um so we just had a, a wonderful talk on x-ray astronomy so you know one one um, snapshot of an x-ray sky is there in the in the bottom middle of the slide which shows the um uh, point sources observed by the xmm newton observatory of the esa so i understand that most of them are probably accreting black holes and many other um, x ray sources in in and um some in our own galaxy and some extra galactic sources also uh, but if you i understand that you also had a, a many talks on 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 different branches of astronomy so i Uh, one sort of point i want to get across is that these are sort of different windows to the universe in the sense that each a uh, frequency band of the electromagnetic waves um gives us access to phenomenon that are not necessarily observable using other uh, frequency bands of the of the of the electromagnetic waves for example the middle top uh, part is the a microwave sky this is the observation this is the sky map the temperature map of the cosmic microwave background radiation and i understand that you had a talk on that as well 
So just to repeat, this is a, uh, the radiation coming from very early universe, when the universe was very young, uh, was only 300,000 years old. And it, what is remarkable is that this, this light, this radiation is remarkably uniform uh, across the sky. If you uh, uh, um, uh, uh, identify a temperature corresponding to this particular uh, black body radiation, the temperature corresponding to um, different points in the sky uh, is remarkably close to about 3 Kelvin. But there are very, very small fluctuations in the sky and the temperature fluctuations, and, and these are shown as these, these uh, red and, and blue dots. These red dots are slightly hotter by a fraction of 10 to the minus 6 Kelvin, and uh, these, these blue dots are slightly colder by a, a similar fraction. So they are, there are tiny fluctuations in this remarkably, otherwise remarkably uniform temperature distribution of the sky. And we now know from uh, various cosmological observations and uh, theoretical studies that it is these these hotter regions that became stars and galaxies and so on, and these cool, uh, this colder regions became large intergalactic voids. So it, it is fair to say that uh, most of what we know about the universe came from uh, astronomical observations of light in its different frequency bands. Um, but recently, uh, astronomical observations using messengers that are different from light also have become possible. So these are um, um, uh, some uh, uh, sky maps of the uh, of the arrival directions of various some of the astro particles. For example, the left plot shows the uh, sky maps of the arrival directions of what is called the ultra high energy cosmic rays observed by the Pierre Auger Observatory in Argentina. So these um, uh, black dots are the arrival directions of these cosmic rays which are uh, extremely uh, high energy uh, protons or or heavier nuclei and these have these have energies that are you know millions of times larger than the energies that are achievable in the largest particle colliders in the world like in in, in CERN and Fermilab so there is some cosmic accelerators in the working that accelerates these charged particles to very very high energies we do not exactly know what these are uh, a, lot, a lot of people believe that uh, compact objects like black holes or, 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 uh, or gamma ray bursts or pulsars, etc., play a role in accelerating these, uh, these charged particles to these uh, extremely high energies. But uh, there are a few candidates, but it's not entirely clear what exactly is, is behind uh, in these accelerating mechanisms. Um, on, similarly, on the, on the right side, uh, this shows the arrival directions of um, high energy neutrinos observed by the Ice Cube Neutrino Observatory in the South Pole. These also have extremely high energy neutrinos, um, which are not seen in, for example, in, 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 um, in um, nuclear reactors and so on. Um, again, it is not entirely clear what is, what is producing these extremely high energy uh, neutrinos. Again, a lot of people believe that compact objects are in the work. Uh, but the jury is still out. So, um, but, you know, I, I just want to bring up the point that this is not uncommon in the beginning of a new phase of astronomy, new window of astronomy. When a new instrument opens, it opens up, and a new branch of astronomy opens up, you get more questions than answers. And eventually, we, we hope to understand these observations better by means of theory and, and more and more data. And that's how we make progress in science. And one very a uh, remarkable aspect about these observations using um, non-electromagnetic messengers is that they provide a completely complementary information as compared to the observations using electromagnetic waves. For example, we know that light is, is electromagnetic waves are produced from the surface of objects, stars, and, 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 and etc. While, for example, neutrinos are generated in the nuclear reactions that are happening in the in the in the core of the stars. So by observing neutrinos, you have a direct access to the physics that is happening in the interior of the stars. It's very difficult to get using uh, electromagnetic observations. So they have uh, complementary aspects. And by combining them, one would hope to get a better understanding of the phenomenon involved. And the newest addition to this uh, astronomer's toolkit is the observation of gravitational waves. So this is a, a sky map of the arrival direction of the 
gravitational wave signals that are observed by the LIGO and Virgo observatory. This is slightly older, and this only shows the first handful of um, gravitational observations. Uh, and now we have of the order of 50 observations, so it's not even, uh, it doesn't even fit in this, in this uh, sky, in a simple sky map very easily. So each of these contours shows our um, reconstructed directions of, of one gravitation wave signal. So uh, you, you know, one thing is immediately uh, apparent, which is that unlike the case of um, electromagnetic telescopes or even neutrino telescopes, we cannot localize the, the source uh, very well uh, in the sky. So that is difficult, you know, basically uh, due to the fact that the gravitational waves that we observe are extremely low frequency. They have wavelengths of hundreds of kilometers. So even if you use a, a telescope, a synthetic telescope that is comparable to the size of the Earth, we are basically diffraction limited. And the, our sky localization accuracy is actually at best of the order of a few square degrees. I will come back to that uh, in the next few slides. So before we, we uh, go to the uh, state of the art of gravitational wave observations, let me give you a quick intro to the, to the, uh, um, to the phenomenon of, of, of gravitational waves. The existence of gravitational waves was predicted by the uh, theory of relativity, general theory of relativity by, by Albert Einstein which is the most um, accurate theory of gravity that we have right now. And uh, this, is a, this provides a very different picture of gravity. It's a very different description of gravity from the earlier and very successful Newtonian theory of gravitation. And according to Einstein's theory, gravity is a manifestation of the curvature of space-time. And any massive object, like an apple, or even other forms of energy, like an electromagnetic field, uh, would cause uh, a, a curvature in space-time. So, uh, for example, in the absence of any massive object or any concentrations of energy, the space-time is completely flat. It's a manifold that is completely flat. And our uh, usual axioms of Euclidean geometry holds there. So, for example, if you draw a triangle and add the angles inside the triangle, you will get 180 degrees. But if you go to the vicinity of, of any massive object, like an apple or the sun, then that massive object would curve the space-time around it. And the usual axioms of Euclidean geometry will not be valid there. So for example, if you draw a triangle and add the angles inside the triangle, it will not add up to 180 degrees. So one can actually make local measurements of the geometry of space-time uh, and determine whether the gravity is non-zero or not. So this, uh, this um, uh, curvature of space-time due to massive objects um, has a, a number of uh, remarkable uh, observational implications. Of course, we cannot observe space-time directly. It's not something that we can observe. But the, the curvature of space-time, the, the, the curvature of the geometry of space-time produce a number of observational consequences, which we can actually go and observe or experiment. And one uh, very interesting observational consequence is that uh, light, since the light travels through the shortest distance in uh, between any points in a, in a space-time, which are called geodesics, um, it turns out that light travel, basically gravity bends light. We, uh, we usually observe that the light travels through straight lines. That's because uh, to a very good approximation, the space-time that we live in is basically flat. Even though there is a gravitational field of the Earth, which is actually quite weak in the scale of you know, an Einsteinian theory. So basically our space-time is more or less flat and, and that's why to a good approximation, we see the light traveling in straight lines. But in the vicinity of a massive object, since the space-time is curved, the light travels through the shortest distance between two points in that space-time, which is a curved path. And for example, if there was a, a star whose rays are grazing the limb of the sun, um, it would actually bend due to the gravitational field or the space-time curvature due to the sun. And an observer who is looking from the other side of the sun would see an apparent shift in the position of the star. And this is a, um, something that you can uh, actually predict and calculate. And there is an effect, similar effect in, Einstein, in, in Newtonian theory of gravity also, but the effect predicted by Einstein's theory is, is larger. 
And um, a team of astronomers led by uh, Arthur Eddington, a British astronomer and physicist, Arthur Eddington, um, went to um, observe the position of stars during a total solar eclipse in, in 1919, uh, about 100 years ago, and made some remarkable set of observations, which showed that the bend, no, the, the gravity actually bends light, and that basically shift the position of stars near the near the vicinity of the uh, of the sun, and that shift is basically consistent with what is predicted by Einstein's theory. So this this photograph is an actual photograph taken by uh, one of those teams uh, led by uh, Eddington. And since it's rather difficult to see the stars in this photograph, um, I've made a cartoon version of this. So basically, uh, Eddington and company observed that they basically observed a cluster of stars that is basically coming in the line of sight, the sun. And, um, and, and, and that is shown by these red stars in this, this cartoon picture. Now, after uh, several weeks, when the same cluster of stars appear in the night sky, when, when there is no sun between us and the star, they, they made another photograph, which are basically the actual position of the stars, which is shown by these blue stars. And when they compare these photographs, they could see that the, during the eclipse, when there is sun in between us and the star, the position, apparent position of the stars got shifted. And the closer the actual position of the stars is to the, to the limb of the sun, the larger is the shift. And the amount of shift uh, is basically consistent with what is predicted by Einstein's theory. So this was a, a remarkable verification of Einstein's theory, uh, which made Einstein a celebrity uh, internationally across. Uh, even though most people do not understand what, what, is, the, the, what is Einstein's theory is all about. Uh, but uh, you know, it had, um, uh, um, for example, it was reported the left, uh, the right one is uh, a report came in the New York Times, uh, which very boldly stated that um, Einstein's theory triumphs, and uh, it not only appears in the Western world, but also, for example, the left plot is a uh, is a, is an article written by Meghna Saha in the Kolkata newspaper, The Statesman, where um, Saha states uh, very very emphatically that. If this, these observations hold, this would completely change our understanding of space and time, which is what happened in the last uh, you know, one century. Um, so our, our understanding of, 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 of space and time has, you know, has gone through a, a, a tremendous change over this period of these, this last century. So uh, Einstein's theory of general relativity has made a number of such very, very interesting and exotic predictions, uh, you know, mostly counterintuitive and, and not uh, you know, appropriate in, in, in common sense, not following common sense. But all these exotic predictions have been verified by a number of laboratory tests and, and astronomical observations. So the Einstein's theory has basically passed all the observational tests with flying colors. So the examples, for example, include an accurate prediction of the precession of the orbit of the Mercury. So uh, we know that the Mercury, um, you know, orbit does not close, unlike that of the Earth, for example. It actually precesses, and this amount of precision was, um, you know, partly due to the perturbation of the gravitational field of other planets, etc. But it cannot explain the observed precession. But Einstein's theory can can very easily explain this, this um, orbital precession of the Mercury. Uh, the, the next uh, image is an observation of what is called a gravitational lens, uh, one of the extreme examples of a gravitational lens, which is called an Einstein ring. So this is basically uh, a stronger version of this gravitational bending of light I just described. So what you see is basically there are two galaxies. Uh, one is behind this very bright galaxy that is seen at the, uh, at the middle of, of this, this plot, this image. And this uh, and this this very bright this massive galaxy bends a space, and the light from the background galaxy goes around and bends and forms an image of this of this galaxy. And because of the axial symmetry, this image is circularly symmetric, and that's what we are seeing the circular image. So, so what we are seeing is a, a stretched image of the galaxy that is behind this very bright uh, in a bright spot that is that is that we can see. So the, you know, gravitational lensing has not only been observationally verified. Now, you know, now if we understand, if you believe that we understand gravity, we take Einstein's theory. 
then this observation of gravitational lensing can be used as a very powerful way of mapping out even unseen matter distributions in the universe like dark matter, etc. Um, many of predictions of Einstein's theory like the gravitational time dilation has not only been observationally verified by laboratory tests, it has become part of our modern technology. For example, if you want to use GPS, uh, the global positioning system to localize ourselves in a map like Google Maps, uh, then you have to, you know, GPS has to take into the, the fact that the clocks on board the GPS satellites tick at a different speed as compared to the same clocks on the Earth because the gravitational field that is phased, that is, that is, that is um, experienced by the clocks on board a satellite is actually different from the gravitational field that we feel on the Earth. So this difference between this gravitational field actually cause a difference in the speed of time, the, the, the way that the clocks tick, and you have to take this into account for the GPS to work. There are you know, many, many you know, very extreme examples of, of strong gravity, like black holes, for example, and we have a, a number of astronomical evidence suggesting that black holes, these exotic uh, objects called black holes from which nothing, even light can escape, uh, they are, in, in fact, rather commonplace objects in, 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 in the universe. It is estimated that our, our own galaxy has probably about 100 million small black holes and a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. And uh, this uh, image that, so this movie on the right-hand side shows um, the orbits of stars in the galactic center which all, you know, it seems that all these stars are moving around some dark, massive object. And by basically using the orbital properties of these stars, we can measure the mass of the central object, which is you know, discussed in the, in the previous talk uh, in answer to a question. And it turns out that this, the central object, the central dark, massive object has a mass of about 4 million solar masses. And our simplest explanation is that there is a supermassive black hole at the center of our galaxy. So this is uh, you know, people who made these remarkable observations. Andrea Guess and Reinhard Genzel's team um, uh, got the Nobel Prize in, in physics uh, last year. So to summarize, GR has made a number of very, very interesting predictions. And all of these have been verified by a number of astronomical observations as well as laboratory tests. And the last you know, unconfirmed prediction of Einstein's theory is the existence of gravitational waves. So I told you that basically gravity curves the space-time around it. So massive object would curve the space-time around it. And when these massive objects move, the space-time curvature essentially follows them. And uh, any such accelerated motion would create ripples in space-time. These are called gravitational waves. And these ripples, these disturbances in space-time curvature would propagate outward the speed of light, according to Einstein's theory. Um, and even before this um, LIGO's observation of gravitational waves five years ago, there was a very, very strong body of indirect evidence uh, that suggests that gravitational waves do exist uh, in, the, in, in the physical world. And these come from the radio observations of what is called binary pulsars. Uh, pulsars, as most of you know, are spinning neutron stars. They are rapidly spinning neutron stars. And typically their uh, spin axis is misaligned with the axis of the magnetic fields through which the radiation is produced. So it pro they produce basically uh, highly collimated radiation. And uh, so they are, you know, they are spinning. It's like they are, that's a rapidly spinning uh, flashlight. Um, um, a lighthouse, basically. And if we happen to be in the line of sight of this highly collimated radiation, we will see pulses of radiation. That's very, and these, it turns out that these spinning neutron stars are remarkably stable clocks. And you know, by averaging these pulses, we could get very, very accurate estimate of the orbital period of the system. And a binary pulsar is basically a pulsar which is in a binary orbit with another companion, which could be a pulsar or a neutron star or a white dwarf. And there is this one particular binary pulsar system, which is popularly named as the hulse taylor binary, named after the people who discovered this binary system. Uh, it has basically provided a very, very remarkable test of Einstein's theory and the evidence of gravitational waves. Basically, what is happening is that these are two extremely massive and compact stars moving around with 
extremely high speeds, like uh, you know, several thousand kilometers per second. And they, they basically disturb the, the space time and they create gravitational waves. And the system loses its energy and angular momentum into gravitational waves. And as a result, the system, the binary system comes closer and closer. And when they come closer and closer, because of the configuration of angular momentum, they have to rotate faster and faster. So one could see by, by radio observations that are spanning about three decades, people could measure the change in the orbital period of this binary system. This is what is plotted in, the, in, in this right plot. The x-axis is the years starting from 1970s going up to early 2000s. And the vertical axis is the cumulative change in the orbital period of the system. And uh, you see this black dot, which are the actual radio observations, radio measurements. And the line is not a fit to the data. It is an actual prediction using Einstein's theory. So if gravitational waves exist, the system is radiating gravitational waves, the orbital period should change like this, like this black solid line. And here, theory agrees with observations with like sub percent accuracy. It's one of the most accurate astronomical observations ever made. So, so we, have, we have known that gravitational waves are a physical phenomenon. And that is basically what has prompted a lot of uh, large projects to build very large gravitational wave observatories, which made the first observational uh, success in the, in the last five years or so. So they basically work on the principle that gravitational waves are basically freely propagating tidal forces. So when gravitational waves propagate like this, they basically stretch the space orthogonal to them. So they stretch one direction and they compress the orthogonal direction. This is how tidal forces work, right? We, that's how, for example, tides are created on the Earth. So their, their effect is analogous to these, these tidal forces. And basically, if you have a, 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 a ring of particles that are free to move, that they can trace the, the stretch of, and the, the, the trace in the of the change of the geometry of the space, then this ring would be deformed into an ellipse. So one direction get extract, um, um, elongated and the other direction compressed. And this kind of changes can be measured using laser interferometers. So as most of you know, uh, laser interferometry uh, is a very standard technique. And this technique of interferometry is more than a century old, although the lasers were in, in this picture in the last few decades or so. So basically, what is a laser, a coherent uh, light source, like a laser, which is basically shone on a, uh, a beam splitter. It split half of the light into a reflective, a reflective beam and uh, half of the light into a, a transmitted beam. And you use two mirrors to reflect these beams back and they come back and they recombine at the beam splitter again, forming an indifference pattern because the light is a wave. And initially, you can basically arrange the length of the two arms in such a way that the interference is destructive so that no light is leaked to this so-called dark port. And when a gravitational wave hit this interferometer, perpendicular to this interferometer, basically that gravitational wave stretches the space in one direction and compresses it the other direction. So that basically introduces a relative change in the arm length of this interferometer which means that the light will take a longer time to go and come back in this direction, x direction, as compared to the travel time in the y direction. So this can change the indifference pattern. It will change from the dark fringe. And uh, you can actually make a measurement using uh, intensity, like a, a measurement using a photodiode. So it's a very standard technique. But the challenge here is that the expected distortions uh, using uh, due to a, a realistic astrophysical gravitational wave is going to be extremely small. So for example, the fractional change, so like delta L by delta, so like a strain that is induced by the gravitational wave is of the order of 10 to the minus 21. If you take a typical gravitational wave source, like a binary neutral spiral happening at about 20 megaparsec or the kind of first gravitational wave source um, that LIGO detected, which is a binary black hole coalescence happening at about uh, 400 megaparsec. So this means that 
Um, even if you have a, an L, the interferometer, which is an original arm length of, of the order of one kilometer, the delta L, the change in the arm length due to the passage of a gravitational wave, is an extremely small number, which is of the order of 10 to the minus 18 meter. And if you, uh, just to get a scale, it's about a thousand times smaller than the size of an atomic nucleus. So it's an extremely small effect. And if you want to make these measurements, you have to make some very, very sophisticated instruments. And these instruments now exist. In the last decade, they have been um, under commissioning. Uh, there are currently two LIGO detectors in the US, and there is one Virgo in Europe. There is one in, in Japan coming up and another in, in India coming up. I'll, I'll describe that in a minute. So these are two uh, aerial photographs of the LIGO observatories in the US. These are these L-shaped Michelson interferometers with an arm length of four kilometer each. Each of the arm is about four kilometer. And, um, and these, these have been working, the initial configuration of these detectors have been working in the last decade. But in the last five years, they have been upgraded to what is called advanced LIGO with a factor of few improvement in their sensitivity. And, um, and, and they made the first detection. So one very interesting thing about gravitational wave astronomy is that gravitational wave observations require a, a network, a worldwide network of detectors. The reason is that unlike usual telescopes, which can be pointed to very narrow locations in the sky, gravitational wave detectors are basically very broad sky antenna in a broad direction antennas they are you know, practically omnidirectional antennas they can detect gravitation waves coming from practically all over the sky so it's a good thing in the sense that you can detect gravitation waves coming from all over the sky using a very small number of detectors but the difficulty is that you cannot identify the location of the source you cannot point the detector to any direction of the sky and this pointing is done basically achieved in software Basically, by, by combining data from multiple uh, multiple geographically separated in, in, in our detectors, uh, you know the the simplest way of understanding the source localization is by using triangulation. For example, the way all localizes spray, or or even we identify the location of a sound is by comparing the arrival direction of the sun, sorry, the, the sound at about two years. Right, so the, our brain can process the time delay between the arrival of the sound at between the two two years, and that's how we you know we can um, localize the direction of the sky of, of the sound. Uh, and gravitational waves, basic gravitational wave um, observatories, basically operate in, the, in, the, in a similar fashion. So basically, they 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 synthesize uh, by doing an interferometry using the signals itself um, and a, a, a single aperture by combining data from geographically separated instruments like radio astronomers do um, using uh, their aperture arrays as well. So uh, th currently there are a, a bunch of uh, detectors that are operating at different parts of the world, as I mentioned, in, in North America, Europe, and, and Japan. And uh, most excitingly for us, uh, a, a LIGO India detector is being constructed um, uh, in India. It, uh, its location is in Maharashtra in the Hingoli district. And uh, it is, it's a very challenging project, and it is, it's you know, expected to operate in the next five, six years. So if you need more information, there is a website of LIGO India and the Facebook page, et cetera, which is a very active uh, science outreach program. So, um, so coming back to the story of the gravitational wave detectors. So uh, as soon as these advanced LIGO detectors started operating in September 2015, they made the first detection of gravitational wave signal. This is a very sort of loud signal, and uh, this is a, a one sort of visualization and a sonification of of the first observed signal. So you can see that the, the x-axis is a time. It's basically a, a time series of the intensity fluctuations in the photodiode due to the passage of the gravitational wave. Right, so the x-axis is the time, and the y-axis is the amplitude of the gravitation wave um, signals that are detected by these, these uh, observatories. And in the background, it also shows a, a spectrogram of the signal. It shows the frequency as a function of time. So you can see that this has a chirping shape. It starts at low frequency, and it goes up. 
And this is a this sort of chipping shape is a very characteristic shape of coalescing binary systems. So I told you about the systems of two neutron stars orbiting around each other. Similarly, in this case, these are two black holes, the very, very massive black holes orbiting around each other. And when they move, they emit gravitational waves and they lose energy into gravitational waves. And as a result, the system, the, the black holes come closer and closer. And, and because the conservation of angular momentum, they would rotate faster and faster. So that, that, is, that is why the, the frequency of the gravitational waves is basically proportional to the frequency of the orbit. And, and that's why the, the, the frequency increases with time. And eventually, these, these black holes merge to form a single, more massive and rapidly rotating black hole that basically then dies down and, and sits there without producing any, any further gravitational wave or, or any other um, signal. So this particular signal was produced by the merger of two massive black holes at a, at a billion light years away. And, in the, and, and of course, um, you know that the founders of, of LIGO, uh, Ray Weiss, Barry Barish, and Kipton, uh, were um, awarded the Nobel Prize in 2017 for decisive contributions to the LIGO detector and observation of gravitational waves. In the last um, five years, LIGO and its sister observatory, Virgo, um, have observed of the order of 50 gravitational wave signals, the number of detections are increasing as a function of time because the sensitivity of these instruments are increasing as a function of time. And um, now the gravitational wave data is also completely public. The um, uh, many independent groups outside the LIGO Virgo collaboration have also analyzed the data and identified additional sort of weak signals that are buried in the data using better and better data analysis techniques. And um, we have so far completed the analysis of the data from the first two observing runs and the half of the third observing run, and the analysis of the data from the second half of the third observing run, which was concluded in, in March 2022, uh, is, is being analyzed. And um, this has already resulted in a remarkable amount of science um, from these in the last five years. For example, these observations are, of course, the first direct observations of gravitational waves. Uh, they are the first detections of the of, of merging binary black hole system. We have not observed any binary black hole system uh, categorically, which actually merge also within the lifetime of the universe. These are also the first observations of stellar mass black holes that are much more massive than we have seen from, for example, X-ray observations. We are, I mean, many many black holes that LIGO has seen are much more massive, about you know more than. 30 or 50 times the mass of the sun, while most of the black holes we have seen using X-ray observations from our own galaxy are less than about 10 or 15 solar masses. So there is a new population of heavy black holes out there in the universe, which we did not know could exist. We also have seen some potential evidence of intermediate mass black holes. This is one particular signal, which is codenamed GW190521, which means that this happened in 2019, May 21 which was produced by the collision of two very, very massive black holes. And the resulting black hole is believed to be an intermediate mass black hole, which is more than uh, 150 solar masses. And uh, there is, was this remarkable observation of a binary neutron star merger, which was not only detected in gravitational waves, but also detected across the electromagnetic spectrum. Uh, we detected a GRB associated with this, this, this merger of neutron stars and the associated uh, isotropic emission called the kilonova. Uh, this was a remarkable um, observation. This is one of the you know, most remarkable examples of a multi-messenger observation. And a tremendous amount of science has come out of it. I'll, I'll briefly mention that in the next uh, slide. Uh, there are some additional candidate binary neutron star event and a potential neutron star black hole event. In fact, there is this one particular signal uh, which is codenamed GW190814, which means a 2019 August 14 event. This is either, so this involves um, um, a, a binary system of a very massive black hole and a light compact object, which is the heaviest neutron star that we know of or the lightest black hole that we know of. So we do not know which of this is true, but it has to be either of this. In, 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 in either case, this is a, a remarkable observation. We have not seen a compact object of this mass before. Uh, 
So if you want more information, there is a, a link to the uh, publications of, of the LIGO Overgo collaboration. And there are very accessible science summaries of each of these papers, which you can read from this, this outreach um, uh, email, sorry, sorry outreach um, website. Um, so just to give you a, 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 a brief summary of the science that has come out this, and that is coming out of this, these gravitational observations. So for example, these observations have now become a very, very powerful probe of the astrophysics of black holes. So there are some uh, very, very interesting questions. Um, although we have observed these 50 binary black holes with you know, very, very high masses and so on, it is not clear how nature forms these binary systems of black holes, especially these black holes, this, this, these heavy black holes. And we do not know what is the mass function of black holes in the universe because so far we have only observed these stellar mass black holes from our own galaxy itself. It seems to be a very biased sample because now we are seeing these extra galactic black holes. They seem to be uh, much more heavier and there are you know, many, many, many other kinds of black holes in the universe than, than we have thought before. So what is the, the mass distribution of black holes is a very interesting question. And these observations are starting to probe these questions. Gravitational observations provide a very, very powerful way of probing the nature of strong gravity. So as far as we know, gravity, this general theory of relativity is our best understanding of gravity. But does it mean that it is the ultimate theory of gravity? No, we, we know that there are basically uh, limitations to the, to, the, to the GR. For example, we do not know the, a quantum theory of gravity. Uh, we, know, you know, we cannot quantize GR in the, in the name way. Uh, there are also some possible, you know, puzzling observations, which, uh, which in cosmology, etc., which might suggest that GR is probably not the right description of gravity at a very large length scale. Not clear. Uh, so it turns out that gravitational wave observations are a very, very powerful way of testing Einstein's theory because uh, they these these signals come from a regime of extreme gravity and extreme velocities. For example. Before they emerge, these black holes are moving at speeds close to the speed of light, something like half the speed of light. And they include, they sample extremely strong fields, which we cannot um, obtain in any other astrophysical observations. So if it turns out that the GR is a correct description of the gravity in this extreme regime, that's a pretty good observational test of GR. Uh, there are, one could also ask, you know, uh, are these indeed black holes? or something more exotic. For example, uh, you know, I, I told you that this, this, uh, this mass measurement of the supermassive black hole, the center of a galaxy, or we can say that there is a dark and compact massive object at the center. That's all these observations tell. And our, it is our simplest explanation that there's a black hole, but it could be something more exotic that we do not know to exist. And it turns out that gravitational observations similarly allow us to, to probe the nature of such small compact objects. One could eventually find out whether there is evidence of black hole horizons or something uh, more exotic. Uh, the neutron star observations of gravitational or gravitational observations of neutron stars also provide a very uh, powerful way of understanding the state of extremely dense nuclear matter, which we cannot produce in the laboratory. The neutron stars are a natural laboratory in which matter extreme matter exists in these extreme conditions because of the, the extreme gravitational pull of the of the gravity uh, of this neutron star. Uh, matter is crushed into super nuclear densities. And we do not know how what is the behavior, what is the, what is the nature of matter at these extreme densities. And one could it turns out that the gravitational observations will contain some imprint of this equation of state of this dense nuclear matter. Gravitational observations will give a, a different way of uh, cosmological observations. For example, what is called cosmography, measuring the expansion history of the universe using a technique called standard sirens, which are analogous to the standard candles that are popularly employed in the, in the cosmological measurements. And there are also, so far we have only detected gravitational waves from merging compact objects, but we expect to detect other kinds of sources as well. So a stochastic background of gravitational waves or uh, rotating neutron stars or, or a galactic supernova. There are all more kinds of speculated sources like primordial black holes, which would be produced in the very, very early universe. 
There are also some very interesting new phenomena also, like the gravitational lensing of gravitational waves. It turns out that gravitational waves are bent by gravity exactly in the same way as, as light. So while we have observed the gravitational lensing of light, there is a possibility of observing gravitational lensing of gravitational waves in the next few years. So these are all sort of our known unknowns, but there could be completely unknown unknowns as well. And uh, that is, you know, if you look back in the history of astronomy, with any new observational window, we have seen phenomena that we have not known uh, before. So one could as well expect something completely unknown using these observations. So I just want to drive home the point that the gravitational wave astronomy has only begun. Now, the LIGO, Virgo has, LIGO and Virgo have not yet achieved their design sensitivities, that they are still being improved. And they are hoping to achieve their design sensitivity in the next couple of years. And there are already next upgrades of the LIGO uh, and Virgo are planned, including uh, new observatories in India, like LIGO India. And this means that the number of observations that we expect in the next few years would increase in a very dramatic way. They each, each factor of two improvement, the sensitivity of the instruments would increase, a would provide a factor of eight increase in the number of events. So, for example, the left plot shows how our um, cumulative number of events is increasing as a function of the space-time volume that we are probing using these observations. So, with more time, our space-time volume is increasing. Also, with our because the time is increasing, with also better sensitivity, we also will be able to probe larger volume of the of, this, of the local universe that will also increase our space. So, with a combination of these two, longer observations and better instruments, our space-time volume would increase. Uh, by a factor of few, sorry, a factor, a, a, a few order of magnitude in the next um, several years. And we are expecting to observe hundreds and possibly thousands of gravitational observations in the next five years. So they are really opening up a, a new branch of observational astronomy. So um, let me just repeat. So far, um, so the, the recent observations by LIGO and Virgo have opened up a, a new branch of observational astronomy. And so far the first, the, you know, the, 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 the highlights include the first detections of binary black holes, the first tests of GR in the highly uh, relativistic regime, possible new po black hole populations, including massive black holes, intermediate mass black holes, et cetera. Um, and from this multi-messenger observations of a, of a neutron star system, uh, we have a very strong evidence that the short gamma ray bursts are produced by the, the merger of neutron stars. Now, this has been speculated, but the first time we are seeing an evidence of that. And from the observation of the tidal deformation of these neutron stars, we have some uh, decent constraints on the equation of state of nuclear matter in, in extreme conditions, and this would improve in the next several years. They also provided an, an independent measurement of the expansion rate of the universe. Again. It's a very modest measurement at the moment, but by combining these measurements in the next few years, we are hoping to make some uh, precise and useful measurement of the Hubble constant. And this would be useful because currently, although there are very precise measurements using other observational windows, uh, different observations of the Hubble constant actually seem to be inconsistent. So there is a little bit of a controversy in the actual value of Hubble constant. And it, it might be possible that these gravitational observations would contribute to resolving this, this, this controversy. And, um, and as I said, we expect hundreds of detections of gravitational waves and possibly thousands in the next few years. So they are, this is basically beginning of a new branch of astronomy. So let me stop here and uh, I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Rajiv. Um, are there are there any questions for Professor Rajiv?
I, there is a I, question in the chat. Yes, it says, please, uh, please. yeah, LIGO observation is based on Michaels and Morley experiment. So indeed, this interferometer that was developed by Michelson for this famous experiment with Molly is the basis of the LIGO, uh, LIGO's um, detector. But of course, it, is, it has gone through several um, technological innovations because um, while the Michelson original interferometer could probably measure a few orders of magnitude, a fraction of a few orders of magnitude smaller than the velocity, the, the wavelength of light. In LIGO, you are measuring something like a factor of a fraction of 10 to the 11 of the of the of the wavelength of light. So it has to uh, undergo a lot of innovation to make this very precise measurement. But the baseline is the Michelson interferometer. So the next question is, in your slide showing the neutrino map, there's a particular region from which we get a maximum number of neutrinos. What are these sources of these seas? It turns out that there is no such particular direction. Um, so there is, of course, if you only a small number of um, um, points, there will be some what is called poisson clustering of these events, which are just purely statistical. And the people have carefully looked at the clustering and my understanding is that there is no preferred direction of these neutrinos. So they all seem to be extragalactic. But I'm not an expert on this neutrino uh, astronomy. So the next is, um, uh, there could be some exotic compact object other than a black hole. So could it be a boson star? Yeah, so the, there are uh, theoretical constructions of exotic ultra compact objects. And uh, you know examples include things like boson stars or grava stars, etc. They're all um, currently all theoretical objects, and we do not have any strong evidence of any of them in the nature, but it would be an interesting idea to test. I guess that's all. Can I ask one? Sure. Yep. Uh, firstly, uh, thanks for the beautiful talk. And I have a very uh, naive question and uh, even may not be a right one. But anyway, uh, let me ask. So I have heard many times that uh, gravitational waves are essentially uh, ripples in space time. Mm -hmm. But almost every time we talk about the effect on 3D space, like the lengthening of the uh, LIGO arms while detecting gravitational waves. So could you please explain at least uh, qualitatively what effect does the wave have on the time, which is the fourth dimension? Yeah, so um, it, it, it also has an effect of time. So if you, for example, have a very, very precise clock that, that can measure the changes um, uh, in the change in time, one could actually measure gravitational waves using that clock. So, but it turns out that the precision of our even best atomic clocks are not good enough for that. So that's why we are we are um, primarily focusing on the effect of gravitational waves on space because using uh, interferometer you can measure the round trip in you know, a round trip time of two orthogonal directions very accurately. Okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, what next? There's a question of what could be the sources of primordial gravitational waves. So uh, there are many possible sources. Um, one is um, one is the the quantum fluctuations in the very early universe could be amplified due to processes like inflation, and um, cosmologists predict that if the inflation is right, there there is a whole uh, spectrum of gravitational waves which are there's no preferred scales. It's in all all scales. So that's one one um, one uh, possible source of uh, the most likely source of gravitational waves. Um, there are also other um, ideas like various kinds of phase transitions happening in the early universe could also pro produce some uh, gravitational waves. Um, there is a question though. 
how we are looking to modify the template banks for modeling the binary black holes merges to more precision to describe the whole process of merger in spiral ring down. Right, so I think this is a slightly advanced question. So the question is, you know, how are we modeling these expected signals from black holes so that we can match them uh, against the data? Um, the, 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 the signals from binary black holes can be fairly accurately modeled now by combining analytical calculations with supercomputer simulations or numerical relativity. So we have such template signals that model the uh, gravitation waves from the in spiral ring down merger and the ring down of the binary black holes. Uh, we do not have these for binary neutron stars because the merger of binary neutron stars is much more complicated than that of pure black holes because there's a nuclear matter involved, uh, possible other effects, effects like neutrinos, magnetic fields, etc. And it's a it's, um, much more uh, complicated system. And um, we do not, we have not fully solved this problem. People have not fully solved this problem yet, although there are uh, great advantages made. But it turns out that because these, black, these neutron stars are very uh, low masses, they have high frequencies. And it turns out that even if you neglect a little bit of signal from the merger and ring down, you can get sufficient signal to noise ratio by looking at the long in spiral. But there are ongoing work that tries to um, um, improve the, uh, the templates that are used in detection parameter estimation. There's a question of how, as an engineering student, how could you get into this line of work? Uh, LIGO is, in, in fact, an engineering marvel. So there are, you know, there are probably equal amounts of instrumental scientists and engineers who work in the LIGO instruments. Uh, there is a lot of sophisticated applications of, of um, mechanical engineering, for example, in designing of the vibration isolation systems in LIGO. There is a lot of vacuum technology. There is um, optical systems. And there is a very strong uh, control system problem also. And uh, there is, of course, there is some data analysis and numeric problem also. But so if you are a you know, really a professional engineer, there are a lot of instrumental work that um, uh, engineering students can contribute to. Um, Um, this is what is Q's light and what other techniques are used to increase sensitivity. This is an expert uh, region where I, my expertise is you know, going to be limited. But as the, as the idea is that because of the quantum mechanical uncertainty principle, we know that we cannot measure the position and momentum of a particle simultaneously very accurately. And if you translate this to the optical field, it means that we cannot measure the amplitude and the phase of a photon or a, or a, or a laser beam um, equally well. But uh, we can measure one such quadrature with arbitrary accuracy such that by compensating the precision on the other part. And basically the skews light um, uh, injection, what it does is to, uh, uh, you know, by, by means of some nonlinear crystals, introduce a correlation between the amplitude and phase. And in this way, then we could, one could actually measure one quadrature like, like phase um, uh, much more accurately. And this can improve the sensitivity of the measurement in, in certain frequency ranges. So what is the future in gravitational observations? That's, um, I think that was a summary of my talk. I don't want to repeat that talk. Uh, sir, for, for modeling the accretion disk, also we go for combining uh, uh, analytical relativity and numerical simulations. Um, yes, I mean, the, 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 you know, if you, when it includes hydrodynamics, uh, etc., and accretion disk, it's a much more complicated problem as compared to a problem involving two black holes only. It's a relatively simple problem in terms of the complexity involved. So, uh, Analytical calculations, modeling, accretion, this, et cetera, uh, as far as I know, can only give you a qualitative picture of these things. And the actual numerical simulations are much harder also. Uh, it is possible that because of the complexity of the, of the numerical simulations, people make various kinds of analytical approximations and merge these two. But I'm not an expert on this. Can you give a brief idea of the two states of polarization of gravitational waves? So, uh, they are analogous to the polarization states of light. Um, as we know, uh, 
light electromagnetic field is a vector field. So you can think of a polarization as a preferred direction of the electric field, um, like you know, x or y. And, and these polarizations are both perpendicular to, to the propagation of direction. Uh, but gravitational waves, the fundamental object, like an electric field, is, a, is, a, is called a metric perturbation. It's basically a, a, a tensor that defines the geometry of space-time. And because of the tensor, uh, and so the, then the polarization states also tensors, basically. So, uh, for example, you can imagine one polarization state as something that um, squeezes a, in a deforms a ring of particles in an ellipse in the x direction in one half cycle and y direction in the next half cycle. So that's a one polarization state. And the, that's called a plus polarization. And the other state is basically to do something very similar, but except that this axis is rotated by an angle of 45 degrees. So you can write basically now any gravitational wave as a linear combination of these two uh, polarization states according to Einstein's theory. Just like you can write any electric and magnetic field in terms of polarization vectors. Okay, I guess we are done. Seems seems like it. Thanks a lot. I'll... Thank you. What? For agreeing and then uh, Professor wanted to talk. Uh, Thank you. I hope the participants have immensely benefited. And uh, yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks a lot. Thanks to all the speakers and the coordinators for today. Yeah. Um, that's, I think, at the end for uh, the ninth day of the, uh, of the winter school. So we have tomorrow is the last day. And so we are looking forward to three more lectures, which are exciting. And so, yeah, uh, <laughs> time just flies. We just started on the 1st of February, and this is right. the last day. OK. But yeah, we are having some wonderful lectures, so we are really fortunate. And so, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Ajit, also, for agreeing. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening, and right. take it all. Yeah. Yeah, take care. Bye-bye. Okay. OK, so I think we can. Uh, Is there an announcement, uh, Bhupesh ji? Okay, so I think I think we are coming to the end of the session uh, today. So, and I think thanks, thanks Siddharth and Manomita for hosting. And um, we we tune in again tomorrow at two thirty for the next lecture.